first meeting in council 2021 in this room it's uh, nice to be back in person and uh, off of zoom uh, zoom's a great platform to use but it kind of gets old after a while when you can't look in people's eyes and and you just can't express things the same way we will begin with our invocation by deacon mark Clifford. thank you sir Yes, it's good to be here in person. I'd like to offer this prayer for God and Father as we gather again in person to deliberate matters for the good of this great city. We pray that you send your Holy Spirit upon these council members and these citizens attending tonight's meeting, granting them wisdom and insight into the matters that will be discussed. Guide them to know what your will is on each of these topics before them tonight. We ask for your continued blessings on our community and its citizens, praying that you will lead us all into ever deeper relationship with you. Help us all to be good stewards of everything you've entrusted to us. We make this request to you, God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In our uh, study session this evening, The first, uh, let me do this first. I'm going to switch this around and do the proclamation first, if you all don't care. Every year, over 36,000 Americans are killed in acts of gun violence, and 73,000 more are shot and wounded. And whereas by early February, more Americans are killed with guns than are killed in our peer counties, countries, in an entire calendar year. Whereas 58% of American adults or someone they care for has experienced gun violence in their lifetime, demonstrating the reach and impact gun violence has in communities across America. And whereas Americans in cities across the nation are working to end senseless violence by advocating for common sense gun safety legislation. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and do all we can to help keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our community safe. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Bob Fox, mayor of the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, do hereby proclaim this week of February 1st to February 6th, 2021, as National Gun Violence Survivor Week. Everybody has to smile. Yeah, <laughs> smile. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. We, uh, as part of our study sessions this year, we uh, felt like it was important for the community to be more aware of what our uh, advisory boards do and other committees that we have in the city. And so each month, we are having a presentation from one of those boards uh, to just kind of update the public on what they do and how they do it. And tonight, it's Board of Adjustment. So, who's coming up here? Ryan, Charlie? A lot of people wonder what the Board of Adjustment is. We're going to find out, right? Absolutely. My glasses are fogging up, so if you forgive me, I'm just going to kind of pull this down a little bit. 
Okay, so tonight is the second in the series of advisory board presentations uh, this year. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the Board of Adjustment, and uh, we'll keep our presentation short because we know you have a lot of things on your agenda tonight. Uh, with me is Charlie Hobble. He is the chairman of the board. Um, so I'll begin by giving you some background information about the Board of Adjustment, and then I'll turn it over to Charlie, and he's going to talk a little bit about the uh, board's accomplishments and some other things that he'd like to share with you. Give a slide. Nope. Please continue and I'll find them. <laughs> we'll get those for you in just a moment. Uh, I just want to start with some quick facts about the Board of Adjustment. Uh, the board is established under the authority of Chapter 89, state laws, revised statutes of Missouri. Uh, chapter 89 requires cities that have zoning regulations to establish a board of adjustment. So it's not optional. If they have zoning regulations, they have to provide a means of relief, which is a variance process, and they have to have a board that's responsible for hearing and deciding those type of cases. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a requirement of state law. Um, Cape Girard, of course, does have a zoning ordinance, so we were required to establish our board of adjustment. Uh, the requirements, the, the establishment of the board, the composition powers and duties of the board are in the city code in section 30-204, which is in the zoning uh, ordinance. So if you want to read more about the board, you can look at that section. Uh, the board is what's called a quasi-judicial body. This is different from the other city advisory boards. Uh, quasi-judicial meaning having some similarities, in part some powers like a judicial body such as a court. Uh, obviously not all the same powers, but they do have the ability to uh, conduct a hearing, uh, find, make findings of fact, conclusions of law, and decide and hear a case. So uh, that's something that's fairly unique uh, about the board. Unlike most of the uh, city advisor boards, uh, the Board of Adjustment is a fairly small membership. It only has five regular members and three alternate members. And that is established in Chapter 89. There's no ability to vary from that. So they're set as far as their composition. Um, and like the other advisor boards, they do have officers, chairman, vice chairman, and secretary. Uh, the Board of Adjustment meets on the first Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. here in the council chambers. Um, of course, they have the ability to reschedule meetings and even hold special meetings on an as-needed basis but the regular meetings are once a month here on the first Thursday. Uh, and then, of course, the board has the ability to establish committees, um, just like the other advisory boards. Uh, as far as the board's powers, uh, they have the ability to hear and decide appeals of actions by the city staff in enforcing the zoning ordinance. So, for example, if I were to make an interpretation, and let's say a uh, a particular land use is not permitted in a particular zoning district and the applicant feels that I've made an error in that judgment, they would have the ability to actually file an appeal with the Board of Adjustment and they would hold a hearing and decide that. Um, they also hear and decide requests for variances from the zoning ordinance, which we talked about. Uh, they also hear and decide appeals of actions by staff when it comes to the floodplain regulations. A lot of folks don't know that. Um, they also have the ability with the floodplain. Uh, and then, of course, variances from those regulations as well. And then lastly, they have the ability to hear and decide uh, on requests for liquor license when the establishment is within 200 feet of a church or school. That was something the city uh, established by ordinance a few years ago. And so that uh, duty was given to the board. Um, a majority of the board's cases fall under the category of zoning variances. The vast majority of what they do is reviewing uh, zoning variances. With that, I will turn it over to Charlie, and he's going to talk to you about uh, some of the board's accomplishments. If you can hear me, I'll talk as loud as I can. Uh, appeals, we've had none over the past five years. And I'm, all these that I'm giving you are on a five-year basis. Variances, we've had 50 cases. We've... Uh, had 40 approved, six denied, four withdrew. Liquor license uh, within the 200 feet of a church or a school, 
we've had six cases, five approved, one denied, and none withdrawn. A uh, common variance request includes setback encroachment number or size of accessory structures on a residential lot. Accessory use or structure on a lot without a principal use. To give you an instant what that is, Centenary Methodist, they have their church, but then across the street they have a lot which is a parking lot. They bought a new van and they had no place to put the van and they wanted uh, one of the... Uh, And so we approved that. Uh, most of the time, we in the older part of town to where the codes are not what they were back then, what they are today. And there are a lot of exceptions because they built the houses much closer together. You could almost walk out of your house have a little leniency to individuals. Uh, also, the problem uh, in certain parts of town, uh, all parts of town, in the older, is having alleyways. They had no parking on the street. The alley went to their garages. And so we have to uh, hear some of that. Uh, then the other one is structure expansion of a non-conforming use or a structure. Uh, give you a good one, the latest, or maybe not the latest, but a good one, is the Marquette. Uh, the Marquette had its parking, but they'd own the parking lot, and they were trying to make uh, a deal or sell it or lease it to the chamber. So that was that. There's many others. Uh, that we hear. Uh, the uh, last thing was evaluating the zoning changes and recommending changes. We have run across the last 18 months to where right now the city code had had a, a square foot basis and your structure could only be a certain and we just felt it wasn't enough and we could eliminate a lot of uh, problems and headaches for individuals. So we changed, and you all approved it about, I think, 15 months ago, uh, right then. Eric handled it, uh, but we've increased the size of the structures because somebody that had a older home that had a very small garage and wanted to increase it to a double they weren't allowed to, but we've changed that to where that uh, is acceptable now. Uh, just two or three things I want to bring up. One, uh, I got Scott um, a month ago when he came to visit. One thing I'd like you all to consider, uh, this day and time, finding good applicants that really want to dedicate themselves to a committee, one of the hang-ups, we lost three on PNZ. I served before we got a uh, time limit. I served 25 years on the planning and zoning. We lost three of the best members we ever had due to cancer, radiation treatment, and they had to miss more than three months. Uh, so what I would like to see is uh, I only need those to see, so I don't need to see right <laughs> good, now. Uh, you don't need to see us. <laughs> yeah, I, I do it by Braille. Uh, is to consider, and there shouldn't be a lot of flexibility. If you've got an illness, uh, you're going to doctor, hospital, is get an excuse, and get an excuse for medical. Nothing else. Not vacations, not school, not graduation, not marriage. Nothing but medical because I know for a fact, and I just talked to another individual, that he's going through problems now, and he doesn't want to get on because he said, I'll mess up, I'll be gone in three, four months. So I'd like for you to consider. The other thing that I'd like for you to consider, 
we used to do it on PNZ with the past two or three mayors, and we need to start it back. We never know the applications that you all are getting for individuals. We don't know about it. We find out after the fact. So what we're wanting to do, and we had that discussion a month ago, we're going to, we used to do it on PNZ all the time. We're going to get notify the board members or the committee members that they need to try to find a good individual that wants to serve. And then we go over those and bring you a good name. Now, I just received Friday four individuals, and I don't know these ladies and gentlemen from anybody, but their first, second, and third choice was not us. And then at the bottom in small print said, are anything. Well, that's not good enough. Now, we just had one. I just found out. We just received one today. And the first thing they wanted to serve on is the variance board. Now, another problem we've got that I wasn't aware of till I got into this this past week, we've got three alternates. And that's done by the state of Missouri. But those alternates, we've had one on for 20 years, and he's never been appointed. And I, I made them go back to look a second time, and they were on there 20 years. What I think should be done is these alternates, if they want to go to be full-time, then they need to have first choice of going full-time, because you've, you've already appointed them uh, to uh, alternate on the board of a variant. So we want to get involved and try to find you good people that want to serve that really do want to try to make a difference. You know, the, the thing you have to do is keep an open mind. Our, we don't care if it's big, little, rich, poor, who it is, try to be consistent and try to be fair and try to find people that got a good head on them, that's open-minded, but can make a decision. And you know, most of the time, if you've got the right information, you'll make the right decision. Other than that, if you got questions, I'll answer them. If not, we're done. <laughs> Charlie, thank you for your expertise. Yep, not a problem. Anybody have any questions? Nope, thanks, appreciate okay. it. At this point, we'll move into communication and reports. Council? I'm going to echo the exact same communication report that I've said for the past year almost. Uh, I thank everybody for in this room for wearing your masks and socially distancing. Uh, I thank everybody in the community and in the region that are wearing masks and socially distancing. And I just encourage everybody to keep it up. Um, the, the vaccines are rolling out, but yet well, this isn't over. And so we just need to make sure that our hospitals are, are healthy and that our populace is healthy and just everybody keep it up for now and let's uh let's really crush this COVID thing and and hopefully we'll have a, a, a 2021 where we can see an end to this so thank you everyone okay anybody else i do okay um i was going to tell everyone next monday february 8th at one o'clock the city is um continuing its one cape virtual learning experience um hosted by our very own Nicolette Brennan. Um, I will be in attendance, but um, more importantly, Stan Polovic, will, uh, Director of Public Works, will, will be in attendance. And uh, it's a good time if anyone is interested um, to learn more about all the things that Public Works does, about all the streets and infrastructure issues that we have, um, bring some questions, and uh, it'll just be a great informational time. So I hope people can join us. You can join, you can watch live on, our, on the city's Facebook page or you can register, uh, pre-register, and join the Zoom call. Correct? Okay. All right. Hope to see you all there. Anybody else? Nope. Yeah. <laughs>
and in that same vein, if you, if anybody is at all interested, the last one, I want to thank Mr. Voss, who's also in the, in attendance here, former Councilman Voss, who, uh, with myself and along with Nicolette, were able to, um, and uh, Dustin, our financial director, talked about how council uh, had a discussion about how council makes uh, difficult decisions, and so um, it went into that and. Uh, they all did a fantastic job, and Nicolette is doing a great job putting these together, and hopefully it's a good resource for everybody in the community. So That's the important thing. It's a, it's a resource for everybody in the community. We can't have our Citizens Academy right now, and this is just another way we can reach out to the public and, and uh, let them know what we do as council members and uh, maybe educate them a little bit on what we do and how things how things go and uh, maybe it'll stimulate people to get interested and in getting involved that's that's the important thing uh, Dan mentioned you know wear a mask and, and all that stuff and I uh, I think we all ought to be proud to live in Cape County where that leads the state in vaccinations uh, by a large margin and uh, that is strictly because we've had some entities get together and partner together to work together to get it done, to get the vaccines, to apply for the vaccine, and to get it done. And uh, those partnerships have worked great. And that's great for our county. There are a lot of people vaccinated in our county, and there are a lot of people that come to Cape County to be vaccinated from other places. Uh, but those numbers don't include all those people that come. It's just the people in our county they are counting that. And if you count everybody else we vaccinated that live in other counties, we'd be way far ahead of everybody. So. Uh, it's a it's a tribute to our county health department and the hospitals and the pharmacies that work together to get this done and I kudos to them uh, had a I mentioned last time I had two meetings coming up one was a simple board meeting and uh, there's a couple of big things happening there uh, we are on the verge of uh, completing and approving an update to our metropolitan transportation plan uh, and that involves any kind of transportation, whether it's pedestrian, whether it's bicycle, whether it's cars, whether it's rail, whether it's river, any kind of transportation uh, it covers. Uh, and this plan is a 25-year uh, plan run from 2020 to 2045. Uh, SEMPO is hosting two online presentations on February 9th one from 12 to 1 and one from 6.30 to 7.30. If you go to the Simple website, you can register online at eventbrite.com and, uh, and take part in those. Uh, they'll keep gathering input and uh, we'll probably get that approved, I would say, in April of this year. Uh, one of the other things we did at our last meeting was approve the ADA Pedestrian Transportation, Sist Transportation Condition Assessment uh, and that's basically just pedestrian uh, sidewalks more than anything else. Sidewalks and ramps and everything all around our city. That information is also on their website. Uh, also at a magnet board meeting. Magnet, you know, is an organization who, uh, it's a regional organization uh, with us and Scott County or Scott City and uh, does a lot of things for industrial recruitment and workforce issues. We are in the midst of reorganizing our board and adding some private membership uh, to raise more money uh, so we can do more uh, with all the workforce issues now that are happening around our state. Our governor, that's one of his priorities. It's a great time to be doing that. Uh, they also agreed at the last board meeting to be the fiduciary agent for the uh, feasibility study on the junior college so they will handle that those funds and dispense them because the committee it was not really a, a organized to do to do something like that uh, and considering many of the members of magnet donated to that effort then we felt like that was a, a good thing that board could do uh, I don't really have anything else unless Scott have you anything I'd just like to mention um, that uh, on uh, Tuesday, February 23rd, um, we're going to have a uh, MS4 permit uh, meeting at our public works um, 
a building and on Southern Expressway uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. I know that is extremely exciting. Uh, <laughs> MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. And so this is about storm water as a, and as it comes off and the systems that, that uh, pick that up, uh, clean it, and return it to our streams. And so that's really important to, the, uh, to our health and to the health of water. And uh, so we, uh, we are given a five-year permit from the Department of Natural Resources, and so we are in the process of renewing that. Um, our permit is pretty much the same as the last five years except for one thing, and that is that they are uh, requiring this, uh, this time, this permit, to um, actually put in uh, structures that are built by developers uh, some form of... Uh, of uh, continued maintenance and accounting for that through a deed restriction or some other some other um, uh, document. So we are looking toward a deed restriction. So uh, for developers who are developing subdivisions and building um, detention basins and and uh, uh, trenches to uh, clean up that first inch of uh, rain, uh, we, they have to account to maintain that now. And that will be through a deed restriction. So if you are a developer or no developer, uh, they may want to come out and, uh, and and look at that and and see if that's something they want to protest or uh, or uh, talk to DNR about uh, those requirements. So um, just want to make sure everybody's aware of that and uh, and uh, how important it is to uh, clean up our water and make sure that uh, we're doing all the right things. And there are whole mire of other things, but that's the big change, and so I wanted to uh, make sure everybody was aware of it. Tuesday, the 23rd, 5 to 7 at Public Works. Anything else? That's all I have. If not, we will move on to items for discussion, and the first is a presentation on our Urban Deer Management Program. Honorable Mayor and City Council, good evening. Um, <clears throat> back in September when I took this job, I was pretty certain this would not have been the first presentation I gave to the council. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to say a special thanks to the Department of Conservation, the Administration, the Council. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into an issue of this nature. I'm well aware it's very controversial. Um, it's a very emotional topic. But um, I attempted to use due diligence to make sure that every option available to us as a city was presented to this council to ensure you got all <coughs> options. And while this may be a little lengthier of a presentation than you may have expected, it is not simply a recommendation it is a review of all of our options and also options that are not on the table for us um, I want to thank uh, Department of Conservation especially Erin Shank she's uh, the manager of the <coughs> urban and managed deer hunts up in st. Louis area and she is a wealth of information to be able to get get a lot of this detail from her um, real quick just gonna go over a few things on the background side as far as biology and history of this topic here. Um, some data that was collected back in 2013 on density and effects of overpopulation. Um, methods and options we have. And then finally, I'll get to the staff recommendation. Um, some biological background. For many people in this community, being a more rural community, may know a lot of these things, but I felt it was important for those that didn't um, just to briefly talk about them. Um, typically, whitetail fawns are born in late May and early or late May and June. Um, the fawns do remain with the doe for the entire year until the next breeding season. Um, home ranges are between a half mile and a mile and a half, depending on the circumstances with which the animals live. Um, the rut, what they call the rut or the mating season, happens through November. Um, it's when the males tend to get aggressive. And that's not just um, for deer. Um, 
some historical background. Um, on October 19th of 2020, um, I stood here and, I'm sorry, I sat back in the corner and listened while this was presented to the council as something that needed looked into. Um, there was a gentleman that spoke that the city needs to take some action. Um, there was also a young lady that spoke um, and as we get farther into this presentation, you will see her words never left my head when I was reviewing all of this. Um, public safety is a big matter that I considered throughout all of this and I wanna make sure that's well known. Um, it is disheartening to me when an individual speaks of being scared of getting hit with an arrow. Um, so I wanted to make sure that was always on the forefront of my mind when I was reviewing all these options. Um, in 2013, the city of Cape Girardeau partnered with SEMO to conduct a deer survey um, to find where the densities were at and, and what, was, what was the true issue of the urban deer herd. Um, they studied two routes, and on the next slide you will see the map of that. Um, the deer density survey found uh, an overall population of 38 deer per square mile. Some pockets, though, had over 100, and if you go to the next slide, you will see those pockets centralized around the northeast corner of town and the southwest corner of town. Those were the heaviest dens density populations that we had. Um, depending on how the route fell, um, if you notice up by the golf course and in the area where some of these hunts are had, you don't see much density. But when you go through that terrain, it is very hilly and it is often difficult to see from the road where the deer are at because there are hills and bluffs and everything along the river there. So I just wanted to make that clear as well. Um, urban deer densities. Um, some facts that we got from the Department of Conservation. Um, ecological carrying capacity is considered to be about 20 deer per square mile. Um, social carrying capacity, which would be what some would say the social environment of the area is willing to tolerate um, is estimated to be 40. Um, and then you got the biological carrying capacity. This is a number that is very difficult to come to. Um, if you go over to Illinois where my family's farm is at, we can house a lot more deer because we have acres after our acre after acre of grains, corn, soybeans, and food, um, grasses like alfalfa. We can carry biologically a lot more deer than an urban situation can where there's a lot more concrete and, and less vegetation for them to eat. Um, one of the things I wanted to go over was the effects of overpopulation. Um, landscape damage. Um, during November, well, starting in probably September and going through November, December range, the deer have to clean the velvet off their antlers. They use it as a way to mark their territory um, they tear up trees. Um, when you have an overpopulation of them, they will tear up your grasses and things of that nature. Um, the next thing is deer vehicle collisions. Um, these stats are from the City of Cape Girardeau Police Department. Um, on, on the number of deer vehicle collisions we've had here in the City of Cape Girardeau, it is a rather large number, but that's all in a matter of perspective. Some may see it as not an issue. Others may see it as a, a major issue. So it's just based on perspective. But I wanted to make sure the city council had those numbers in front of them so they could see some of those issues as well. Other effects that happen whenever you have deer around, um, tick-borne diseases, Lyme disease. Um, as a younger man, I was diagnosed with Lyme's disease because of a tick bite. So I know what that feels like. Um, deer will carry those ticks around and, and it could become a big problem. Um, potential for disease spread. This is things of like chronic waste and blue tongue and some of those other diseases that the animals carry with them and they can be spread through close contact of deer and that's why it's prohibited to feed them is because you get them all in close contact, they trade saliva and they pass the disease. Um, bold and aggressive behavior, um, especially during the mating season and when fawns are young, those deer become very aggressive. For the mothers on this board and in the audience, if somebody goes after your baby, you're going to come out fighting me. And, and we all know that. And 
to the men, same principle. You're going to come out fighting. It's not just deer that are that way, but all animals go that route. So those are things you have to consider. Um, Overbrowsing leading to a decline in habitat. And this is not just for the white-tailed deer. Um, for the waterfowl hunters that may be watching or behind me or sitting in front of me, we are on the Mississippi Flyway. Great waterfowl hunting. But if the deer are going through and cleaning up all the grazing properties, for example, the corn stubble fields and everything like that, those birds don't have a place to stop here because there's no food left. So that's something also to consider is not just the deer from the overgrazing part, it is also for the other wildlife that find food through those same resources. Um, mitigation. There are basically two options. You got non-lethal methods and you have lethal methods. Um, non-lethal methods are more about deterrent and control um, through non-lethal means. Um, and lethal methods are about population control. Um, I'll also go over a few methods that aren't allowed and I wanted to make sure those were mentioned as well. So that way, if there are questions from, from anyone on why did we didn't consider this, there is a reason why. Non-lethal solutions, again, they focus on deterring deer from populating an area, um, eliminating food sources, um, minor discomfort, and triggering fear responses. Those are the three main avenues you use with, with non-lethal solutions. Um, some of the non-lethal solutions used, fencing, that's a big one. Unfortunately, city code prohibits a fence over, I believe it's three foot tall in residential areas, and it must have 50% transparency on a front yard. On the backyard, you can have a six, I believe it's six foot tall fence with no transparency options, that will stop a deer. If they can't see where they're jumping over a tall fence like that, they will not jump it. Unfortunately, you can't protect your front yards with that option. Um, repellents, there are various types of these. Um, some cause discomfort by using similar um, chemical components to like a pepper spray. It uses peppers just to cause discomfort and get them out of there. Other ones utilize scent. Um, coyote urine is a big one that they use in those. Um, just predator, predator smells that cause them to just trigger and fear and run away. Um, scare tactics, which I recommend nobody uses um, because it can get into a bad way real quick. Um, running out and jumping up and down in your yard, you scare them off into somebody else's yard. That's all good and well until some mama deer decides to fight back or, or you have a, a buck with antlers gore somebody. And I, I hate to say that, but it can happen. So I, I strongly recommend against that. Um, deer resistant plants. Um, I put quotes around this um, for a reason. Um, as some of you may know, I've, I've dealt with this issue in Wyoming as well. Um, out there, everybody planted deer resistant plants and when the winter gets harsh and food sources are scarce, they will eat those plants. Contrary to what anybody else says, I've watched them do it. Um, here, it's a little easier and I think they are more effective here than what they are in other places, but still <clears throat> use that with a grain of salt. Um, road warning devices, I'm uneducated on the topic, I'll be real honest, I don't know if they work or not. Everybody says they do, but it is an option for you to use if you so wish. Um, and prohibited supplemental feeding. Um, again, this comes back to the spread of CWD. Um, that's the big reason for this uh, rule is you don't want those deer congregating, trading saliva on food or other options that are in the ground. Um, and it is prohibited in the code of ordinances. <clears throat> Lethal solutions. Um, these focus on long-term management of the herd um, using population decrease. Um, the most effective method of this is to harvest does um, if there are no breeding are less breeding females, there will be less little ones running around and the population will come down. Um, of those options, archery hunt, managed hunt, <coughs> sharp shooting, and trap and euthanasia. Um, those are the four big methods that we can utilize. Um, again, those are basically the four only options here in Missouri. Um, real quick, uh, the archery hunt. 
Um, I believe this was the option presented to this council back in 13 or 14. Um, and essentially, it's hunting that occurs under state regulations. Um, the municipality can put additional restrictions on it. Um, it's meant for prop private property, um, any property over two acres. I believe um, the prior one was three acres. You could combine properties with a neighbor if need be um, to get to that three acre mark. And this runs the entire length of the archery season from September 15th through January 15th. It is a standardized archery tag that you can get over anywhere um, that is utilized for this. And it is utilized throughout the whole course of those four months. Um, this is the lowest cost option because all people have to do is get permission from a landowner and buy the archery tag and they're ready to go. And it does work at lowering the population, but may not be the best overall option. Um, managed hunt, and, and you will see, I'll be straight to the point, this is what you're going to see come from the recommendation. Um, this is handled under the state regulations through the lottery system to draw a tag. Um, it is on public properties that we as a city <coughs> designate to the gaming, uh, Department of Conservation. Um, hunters are selected <coughs> through the lottery system by the state. The city does not pick the hunters. I want to make that very clear. We are independent of this. It runs through the standardized lottery system um, that the state has set up already for specified dates and sites. Um, the rules for these are a combination of Department of Conservation rules and city rules. We are allowed to add additional regulations to this, which we are doing. Um, I have met with the Department of Conservation on the additional rules we want to put into place, and they do fully support this plan, that everything we are doing is within guidelines that they feel are appropriate. And that includes the hunt sites and dates. Um, we're in that discussion as well. Um, the city will be tasked with monitoring and checking hunters for compliance. Um, in speaking with the Department of Conservation, they are willing to work with our P uh, police department in conjunction with the Department of Conservation to assist with the enforcement and monitoring of these hunts, um, kind of as one unit to make sure that everything is done right and we're all good. Um, the next option, shark shooters. Um, this is the option utilized in Rollins, Wyoming. Um, I know that because I was out there when that was passed. Um, that's where you have trained marksmen shoot deer over bait. Um, it's highly effective at eliminating the population very quickly. Um, the city would be required to get a special permit. Um, deer meat must be donated through the Missouri Department of Conservation program. Um, that helps raise the cost because we would probably have a company come in that are trained marksmen doing this for us, which is very costly. Additionally, we would have to pay for the processing of the meat to be donated to the program. So this is a very, very costly program. Um, and it would require ongoing maintenance um, throughout the years to continue lowering the population. I did not recommend this program because I don't feel it is appropriate given the urban setting we are in to utilize firearms. It is very quickly turned into a bad situation when you're use, using high-powered rifles in a small condensed area. So that's why this one didn't move forward. Trap and euthanasia. Um, this is a, a very, I believe, rarely used option. Um, essentially, deer are individually trapped and euthanized with a bolt gun um, or a non-projectile device, I should say. Um, we're still required to, say, required to obtain a specialized permit. Um, and again, the deer meat must be donated through the same program as the sharpshooter, and again, it'd be very costly. Um, but no, no ordinance change would be required for this, but it is very ineffective um, trying to catch one deer at a time um, through trapping. Um, now to move forward to methods not allowed. Um, the first one is sterilization. There is some talk throughout 
various areas of utilization of the sterilization method. Essentially what it is, we would catch the deer, tranquilize them, and perform a, I'm not sure if hysterectomy is the correct word, but you sterilize the animal um, so they can no longer pr reproduce. This is an extremely, extremely expensive option. Um, the Missouri Department of Conservation back in the 90s did a sample of this to see how effective it was, and they essentially said they will approve a plan with this. It is very expensive, and it does not lower the population, and as new deer come in that are not sterilized, you're continuing to have to keep going and going, and, and you can never get ahead of the problem. Um, trap and relocate, I know this is uh, one of those plans are one of those options people often refer to. There are multiple reasons why this is illegal, um, and this is something the Department of Conservation will not allow anyone to do. Um, first off, 70% of relocated deer do not survive to the next breeding season. Um, 30 to 35% perish within one month due to our, of relocation due to stress of trap, trap and transfer. The stress of the interaction it basically wears their body down and when they're relocated, they never recover. Um, the remaining fall victim to predation, vehicle strikes and other issues, um, and that comes from acclimating to a new location where they don't know where the food sources are, they don't know where the water is, and all those other things, and majority of them end up succumbing to, to death. The other issues with this are, it, it assists with the spread of disease. Um, CWD is a big issue we we're fighting right now in certain areas within the state and it's actually something going on, going on all over the country. When you take portions of our population out and put them somewhere else, not only do you make it their problem, but you also may be transferring disease along with it. So th those are the big reasons why Missouri ha has pushed away from that option and basically stated it's not legal for us to, to do. Um, considerations for a successful management program. First and foremost will be public safety. As I stated, there was a young lady that spoke at the October 19th meeting that, that, was, that was truly concerned about her safety with the prior program where you could hunt pretty much any property if it was over three acres. That, that those words never left my head again. That was the first and foremost thing was, what can we do within these options that we have that we can do safely to ensure members of the public don't get hurt? Um, the second thing is use of taxpayer funds. Um, this is right down my wheelhouse. As the director of finance, I'm gonna do everything I can. That is my job to protect city funds to the best of my ability. Um, personally, the spirit of fair chase. <coughs> If you are hunting deer with a rifle over bait as a sharpshooter, that is not fair chase to me. That is a personal issue I have. I do believe in the spirit of fair chase that animals may see you in the tree or smell you and they have the option to run. Um, so I, that was one of the factors that I also took into consideration. Um, the types and methods, types of methods available was a consideration. And then objective. What level of urban deer herd do we wish to maintain? If we wish to wipe every deer out, I'm gonna tell you that sharpshooter is probably the best option because we can do it very quickly. But you're gonna to have to write a big check to do so. I feel the recommendation that we are putting forth is both economically sound and over time will be an effective method. This is just the beginning of the program. The urban deer issue did not start overnight and it will not be fixed overnight. This has to be a long-term plan of success. Um, staff recommendations to maintain a herd of approximately 20 deer per square mile. This is gonna be very difficult, but over time we can manage it and eventually get it down to where the herd is more under control. Um, the staff recommends we implement an urban <coughs> deer hunt. Um, to me, it is the safest lethal method available. There are no firearms involved. This will only be for archery equipment. Um, it will allow the thinning of the herd slowly. Um, one of the things that I feel is best about this plan is 
It is the beginning. We can slowly take some out of the herd. We can review the plan. We can find problems with it. And it is manageable with our staff. It is five small properties on the edges of town. I am well aware that, that it's not in the center. I wish I had the map back up. All the way over in the center of town where a lot of those hot As I said in an earlier slide, a mile and a half to a half mile to a mile and a half, they will start moving. But by putting it on the edges here, it gives us as a city and the Department of Conservation the opportunity to work through this program, establish the protocols between the Cape PD and the Missouri Department of Conservation to ensure we're doing this right. We're following all the rules. We got our checks in place. We can go check hunters because there's a limited amount of places they can actually hunt. It's a limited number of hunters, et cetera. So it's a much more manageable program. Each year, you basically do a, a reevaluation of everything. Um, how many deer were harvested? What are the sighting numbers looking like? What are the deer vehicle collision numbers looking like? We can raise or lower the tag amounts if we wish. We can raise or lower the properties we wish to allow hunting in. It gives us some flexibility to manage this as a true plan instead of a guess. Um, four designated areas within the city, uh, Twin Trees, Delaware Park, Fountain Park, and Cape Rock. Um, parks and trails in the hunting zones will be closed from the, for the period of uh, November 11th through December 5th. It will consist of five consecutive seven-day hunting periods um, for this managed hunt. There will be a mandatory orientation meeting held on October 26th. Um, this will give us an opportunity to sit down with all the hunters to ensure they know what the rules of the hunt are. Um, I have coordinated with the Department of Conservation already, and, uh, and if this plan proceeds, they are going to have representatives at this meeting as well to go over ethical hunting, safety protocols, and all those other items that need to be covered to ensure a safe hunt. Um, also, there will be a pill draw for the property you get. Um, so instead of running, this is an intricacy of the lottery system of the Department of Conservation, but instead of having a single draw for each property, we're doing a draw for the entire week, and then they will do a pill draw for which properties they hunt. Um, that was the best recommendation they could give us. <coughs> the end of this. Um, next slide is uh, very difficult to read. There are <laughs> items. There are items within this that are in the ordinance, but not on here. I was trying to get as big as possible and cover as many things as possible. Um, but I'll go through them real quick for for anyone that can't see it. Um, archery methods only will be allowed. Uh, longbow, compound bow, recurve bow, and crossbow. Those are your four options. Um, hunting only allowed in designated areas and designated dates with proper permits issued by the state of Missouri through the lottery system. Hunters are required to use designated parking areas and display provided parking tag on the dash of their vehicle. Um, during the orientation meeting, the Department of Conservation has these dash tags. That way, if they change vehicles while they're hunting there, they keep the dash tag. That way we know they're valid. And when we go in there and hunt, we should be able to check who it is. Hunters must wear orange for the entire managed hunt. Um, during the course of the dates listed for those hunts, you will have the firearm season outside of the city of Cape Girardeau, and it is required to wear hunter orange or blaze orange, whichever term you choose to use. We're requiring it for all hunts in city limits um, for a safety measure. Um, if you see somebody in orange outside of those dates, you're going to call say, why is there a guy in orange sitting up in a tree in Arena Park? It just helps add a level of protection in sight. Um, arrows taken in the field must have permanently written and written in permanent marker on the shaft the individual's Missouri Department of Conservation identification number. In the event of an accident or other issue, we are going to be able to trace back to who that person was. Um, I'm not going to know who it is. It's just going to be a number to me, but we can get Department of Conservation in and they can run the number and find out who the individual is. Um, elevated stands must be used by all hunters, no ground hunting allowed. Um, this is a very specific reason for this. Um, the elevated stands must be 10 feet off the ground. That is to try to ensure a downward shot into the ground. 
and not a shot across the flat plane, which will lead to a trajectory going further into the distance. Um, the elevated stands must also be marked with a Missouri Department of Conservation identification number of the hunter as well, so we know who's, who's in there hunting and everything else. Um, stands are allowed to be placed on the first eligible day and must be removed by the final day of their eligible hunt. If we find one that the eligible hunt has expired for the individual, we will pull the, pull the hunt, uh, elevated stand. Hunter permits will be valid for seven days, as you saw in a prior slide. There are five consecutive seven-day periods. Um, the hunter's tag will only be valid for those seven days um, that they are selected for. Um, lastly, the permit allows for the harvest of two deer, an antlerless, and an either sex. Um, essentially, this is earn a buck program. You have to shoot the antlerless deer first before you can shoot the either sex. Um, a couple other pieces I wanted to cover in that section. Um, Hunters under the age of 16 per the or I'm sorry. Eight. Hunters under the age of 18 per the ordinance must have a s adult hunter certified individual with them in order to hunt. That is an option you guys can leave on the table or choose not to. Essentially, anyone under the age of 18 must be with a responsible adult that is hunter education certified to ensure a safe hunt. I don't want any young individuals out there on their own. Delaware Park. Um, this is the first managed hunt property. Can you go back to slide 24? I missed a very important piece and I apologize in advance. I wanted to address um, the maximum deer harvest. There, there is a rule within the Department of Conservation that party hunting parties can't apply for these managed hunts, up to five individuals per party. In the event a hunting party is drawn, there may be more than eight hunters per week. This will only be the case if they are drawn later in the random draw. Meaning, if a party of five is drawn first, they will take up five of the spots and we will draw three more. This will only come into play if they're drawn last and we have seven drawn already and a party of five is. So please be aware of that rule that we have no control over. Um, they said it is very, very rare that you get hunting parties um, applying but it is something they wanted to make sure we were aware of and I wanted to make sure you as a council understood as well. In the event that happens in all five weeks, the maximum number of deer goes from 80 to 120. Um, so I wanted you guys aware of that as well. That is a rule that is out of our control. Each mm -hmm. hunter in the party would be, or is it per party? The, the, the each, each individual within the party would be eligible for two deer. And that is um, conservation rule. Um, while I'm also thinking about the maximum number of deer harvested, it is very unlikely that we will hit the maximum. Um, it should not be the expectation of this council, the citizens, that we hit the maximum number. Throughout the course of those five weeks, you're going to have varying weather pro uh, issues. Some hunters who apply may not actually ever be able to make it. Um, those things happen. So the level of success is not getting to the magic number of 80. It is a safe, successful hunt that lowers our population, whether it be two deer or 40 or 80. That is the, what I define as a successful hunt. Anyway, back to Delaware Park, please. Um, so the first uh, area is Delaware Park. This is an approximately 11.23 acre piece of property um, located off of Lexington. Um, this is a city owned property. We would have 100 per hunting period in there. The nearest residence from the property line is measured at 80 yards. So if you would be where the 1129 is, where the property is, 
to the nearest point where the property crosses is 80 yards. Um, this is in the middle of one of those zones. Um, this property borders wards one and four where there's a large concentration of deer in the area. Um, the next property is Twin Trees. Um, hunt area one is for three hunters per period and hunt area two is for two hunters per hunting period. Um, on the map there, essentially East Cape Rock Road, or Rock Drive, splits the properties. One is located right next to the river. The second one is up on the mound where the trail goes through. During the hunt, again, the trail would be closed. We would have signage posted, etc., to make sure nobody was in there. Um, hunt area one is 31.66 acres where three hunters can, can hunt. And then the second area is approximately 20.86 areas acres. Uh, area one, the closest resident is considered to be 75 yards, which would be up on the northernmost corner. And the property is over on County Road 654 that was measured to. Um, for area two, the nearest resident is approximately 250 yards away. So can you give us, uh, for those who are not uh, really familiar with archery shooting, what's, what's a typical distance that, that, that you can even make? Uh, responsible hunters probably won't take a shot outside of 30 to 40 yards. Mm -hmm. I, I know there are some with the advances in crossbows. I've heard that are trying to shoot deer out to 100 yards. I don't know why they're doing that. It leads to a wounded animal. That's my own personal point of view. So I know if I offended somebody, I'm not trying to be. But a true clean kill shot is 30 to 40 yards max, in my opinion, based on my knowledge of the topic. The next property is Cape Rock. This is. This will be for one hunter. It's approximately five acres. The actual entire plat of that property is larger than that, but it goes up into where that turnaround is. And I've cut the property off to ensure that we don't have hunters where vehicles are going to be going right there. Um, that was more of a safety measure. The measurement from the residence, nearest residence, is approximately 175 yards. Um, the last one is Fountain Park is located there also next to the Cape Rock Circle. Um, this is approximately seven acres and the nearest residence is 140 yards. Um, before we get to questions from the council, a couple more pieces of information. Um, one of the things we will talk about in the orientation meeting is hunter ethics, safely operating your equipment. Um, wildlife identification, things like that. Um, that's also a, lot, a big part of the hunter education course that you have to have to be able to eligible to hunt. Um, this is a very sensitive topic as I started with, and I know there are individuals that may or may not like this plan. Um, I know some may think, why are we hunting the very edges where the hot spots of the problem are not? Again, this gives us an opportunity to start with five small pieces of property to establish our procedures and a good safety record to ensure we're doing this the right way while you have citizens at a distance and away from the situation. Deer will travel up to a mile and a half in and a lot of these are between a mile and a mile and a quarter from the, what I would consider the hot zones that were on that original map. I'm aware that we are on the edges and, and we're kind of out there. This will slowly work on the population roof. It'll also give us the opportunity, again, like I said, to establish our procedures and protocols to get this done right. And we can reevaluate this and have properties that we deem safe enough to establish a, a hunt in that are in other locations with the city. I just felt it was best to start on city owned properties on the edges to ensure we get this done right before we start producing or putting it out there to a bigger scale. That's what happened in 2013. You basically open it up to any property over three acres. 
that's a lot to manage and that's a lot of safety issues. This is essentially a bunch of small properties on the very edges that we can safely manage um, throughout this process. And that's what we were trying to get to was the public safety um, stance on the whole matter. Questions from the council? I, I'll ask this one and I, I think I understand the answer, but I'll ask it away. Can you go into on the age, talk about it shall be unlawful for any person under the age of 18 and what specifically, um, why there was a date on a Missouri, on a valid hunter education card being January 1st, 1967, instead of not just, I, I, I'm, explain that in, in detail if you don't mind a little I bit. Plagiarized. I figured you did because because I'm sorry, that's I shouldn't say it that way. Um, essentially because that, that's what the state of Missouri has that is the exact same language that's what so, I, so I thought, what it is so. is individuals that are born before the date that is in there and I don't remember it off the top of my head are not required to take a hunter safety course um, anyone born after that date is required to have a hunter safety course in order to to yeah. participate I understand and and it is strictly 100 percent Department of Conservation language I know. They said it well so I didn't feel like reading and and will you talk about mm -hmm. um, without me I mean I could talk about it but I'll let you talk about it will you talk about what the hunter safety uh, course in the state of Missouri entails nope. the hunter education course you I've won't take it you've never taken it I took it in Illinois okay <laughs> well I took it so, uh, when I was 18 years old or 17 years old and it is it used to be an eight hour uh, course that you took at a VFW. You got lucky, Illinois 16 hours. Oh really? Yeah, so it was put on by the Missouri Conservation Department. It was an eight hour course on a Saturday where old and young would sit through. I'm assuming is that still or even probably way more? There, there are options for online um, now that weren't there when I was growing up. But, but the big pieces that, that come out of those classes are, are hunter responsibility and ethics. Those are very big pieces. Um, they talk about how firearms work and how to work them safely. Actually having a firearm there. Um, bows do operate different, but there are options for that as well to learn. But you always operate these things as if they're loaded, as a standard practice with the gun safety. Um, they also talk about um, wildlife identification. Um, all too often you hear of situations where an individual is shot um, during a hunting season because somebody mistook them for game. I'll be real honest. If Scott's walking through the woods and I mistake him for a deer, deer walk on four legs, he walks on two, you're not doing it right. And, and they go through a lot of those details to ensure people realize how to identify the game before pulling the trigger. Um, another part of the firearm safety part is knowing what's behind the target. That is a big piece because when I pull the trigger, I need to know not only what I'm shooting at, but what's 100 yards, 500 yards, 1,000 yards downrange. Um, that's a part of it as well. That's where the elevated stands come in, where if you're shooting at a deer straight down into the ground, you have about three feet beyond your target to worry about because you're shooting down into the ground, where if you're shooting on the ground, you have inf uh, infinite distance. Um, they do talk about first aid skills, survival skills, those types of things and the ones I took. Mm -hmm. um, wildlife conservation and management. Um, knowing what the limits are, knowing to follow those limits. There's a reason why those limits are in place. We have biologists and professionals that, that monitor this stuff. Um, and they talk about a lot of those things. And each state will go into their unique rules that are different. Um, For example, in Illinois, as a trapper, you can get five otter per trapping season. In Missouri, there is no limit. It's these intricate rules that mm -hmm. they go over that are different between the states because those are very important. If I was educated in Illinois, it's my responsibility to know those intricate rules. But here, they go through those very clearly to make sure that, that you're following the proper protocols. Does that help answer your yeah, question? Yeah, no, it does. Um, the only th other, there were um, one, how are they checking in their deer? And two, how do we ensure that good hunters 
are hunting in these areas. First question. How do we know they're checking them in? How, how are they checking them in? I know they will on use, the MH, they will MHDC, the you can yes. tell a check and... Yes, they will still utilize that because these are tags issued by the state of Missouri, so they still have to follow that standard protocol. We are requiring them to also call the Cape Girardeau Police Department and okay. logging the harvest with our team so we can also track it. Okay. I, can, I will work with the Department of Conservation. I know I can get the listing if we miss somebody. Right, absolutely. So that's how we're handling that. that the second one. question's a, a difficult one because there is no guarantee. That's all I can say. Um, back in Illinois, when I hunt, um, there is no telling who is going to be on the state ground that's less than 200 yards from where our property is. He can sling a slug across there and take me out, and I have no control over it. I, I hope that the people are following these guidelines that the Department of Conservation is putting into place. I hope they understand that with the arrow labeled with their Department of Conservation ID number, if that goes slinging into somebody's backyard and they can't find it, when it's found, we will find them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, those are some of the protocols we put in place to try to persuade them to be ethical hunters. Okay. Um, if that helps. I've already asked enough. I'll let somebody else go. On that same question about the how do you ensure they're um, ethical hunters or good hunters, um, when you were speaking about the managed hunt, you said that municipality, it's, it's a state-run program, but it, municipalities have the ability to, to modify it <clears throat> to a certain extent. To some degree, yes. Um, you mentioned the state lottery is run by the state, according to people who apply to be in that lottery. Um, so would they apply specifically for this Cape Girardeau lottery or they apply for all lotteries and then they just happen to get drawn for this one? No, you would have to specifically apply for the Cape Girardeau lotteries. Uh, Do we have the ability as, a, as the city to be restrictive on the qualifications to be in that pool for that lottery, meaning whether they're Cape Girardeau city residents or they have to be Cape Girardeau county residents? We don't Under have that the ability. state lottery system, it would be open to everyone, including non-residents. That anybody that holds a Missouri, or do they, do they even have to be Missouri citizens? Or they do not. Non-residents are able to apply at a much higher fee. Okay, and That's so the then, level. therefore, that answers my question that it's also probably state <laughs> law or Missouri Department of Conservation that we can't be restrictive in not allowing. Um, hunting parties, if we wanted to do that, it has by folding into this system, mm -hmm. we have to accommodate their regulations. Okay. Now, just a little bit more on that topic. Um, as a re Missouri resident that hasn't always been one, um, in order for me to get a hunt license, I had to show proof of a hunter a state sanctioned mm -hmm. hunter education certification. Mm -hmm. um, I had to send a copy of my Illinois certification to the state of Missouri before I could get a hunt license. So even if it is someone from out of state, they have to have a state certification of hunter certificate, uh, safety or education, depending on which state you're in, in order to get a hunt license and get a tag. So this from the safety component, they still have to have those, those trainings. Thank you. I have just to add into what Ravi and Nate had said. So we can't even be more restrictive with regard to if an individual is under the age of 18, then they have to be with a person who is either born before January 1st, 1967. We cannot restrict that further to requiring the MHEC. That is more restrictive than the Department of Conservation's law. So that we cannot change. So the, state, the, the Department of Conservation's rule on that is anyone under the age of 16 must be with said language. Okay. I've increased that to 18 for, again, additional safety okay. protocols. Because a 16, 17-year-old, I feel right. I should fall under that. But, but if we wanted, the, what the question is I'm, is. I'm asking, can we make that, can we that adult have an MHEC certification? 
just because you're born before January 1, 1967. That requires it. That does require it. So if you read the entire piece. It does require it. If they have a, it is the option would. of someone born. Now, we can remove the section that says someone born before whatever the date is and just state certification. We can do that. I would like to see that. I don't. I don't. I mean, I would. Does I would like to make it? sure that person is certified. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that is a piece we can't control. Okay, so we can be more to restrictive. Sim to simply answer that. Okay. Piece, yes. But we can't be more restrictive in our lottery. Correct, because we don't touch. Any other and we can't be more restrictive in. We're talking about white-tailed deer here, but we we also have concerns, citizens, about albinos and piebald deers. We can't be more restrictive with regard to not harvesting of albino. Correct, and that goes back to the Missouri Constitution, where the Department of Conservation has full authority over the wildlife and management thereof, and that with albino deer not being regulated on the state level, we cannot come in and override them on that. Okay, so and that's a particular piece that we have no control over. Okay, so just to be clear, if we decide that this managed hunt is going to go forward, then anyone could take an albino or piebald deer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just like they can in the state. Right. 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 And, and again, that's out of our... Right, of our okay. So My, I have a couple other questions. Oh, if it, can I just ask a uh, follow-up on even more specific? Can we be specific about not allowing anyone under... I can check on that. And, and I don't foresee that being an issue. Um, I, I guess the simplest way um, it was explained to me is Department of Conservation controls the wildlife. We have control on the hunters, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. The hunters. We have control of the hunters. So if we so want to restrict them to wear blaze arms, we wildlife. can. But when it comes to the wildlife issue, they have full control. Does that... Within the, <laughs> within the confines of their established system for the lottery, though, correct. We have to abide by whatever mm -hmm. policies, right. whatever they have for that. Mm -hmm. We can't say no albino, no hunting of albino and piebald, but we can say you've got to wear a place orange. Or we can't say you have to be above eighteen. I mean, that's still some. And I'll double check Mine. on that one. Okay. So, oh, never mind. I have a few more questions. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> do we have the MDC's archery reports for hunting-related accidents? We have not received those. Okay. Um, in conversation, I believe it was at the meeting, Scott, that we were both at. They said they didn't have, to, to Aaron's rec rec uh, recollection, there were not. Oh, in a managed hunt? Yes. Okay. For those no, same, in a managed right. But when I do get information back, I did request that from them. Um, when I do get that back, I will pass that along. Okay. Also, um, is council able to attend this orientation meeting? Absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would encourage that. <laughs> <laughs> just, I've got a list here. Uh, just bear with me. Um, <clears throat> you had talked about in your presentation that sharpshooting was not an option, but it was a requirement under a sharpshoot hunt that that meat had to be donated um, and tested for CWD. Is that, that's, and that's something that the city would have to pay for the expense to test, test the meat for processing. So right? there's, there's two pieces to that. Okay. Um, we are required to have the meat processed and donated. The Department of Conservation may or may not choose to test it because we are not in a CWD zone. Okay, but we are close. We, we are, are close. one county So way. in the zones, they're requiring it. Outside of the zones, it's optional. So there's two different pieces to that. Right, so so part of the, the individuals that support this management also support the share of the harvest, which I don't know if you wanna talk briefly about, but under the current situation, and with Cape County not being part of the CWD management zone, which is the chronic wasting disease management zone, even though we are close, the hunters that participate in this hunt could donate the meat if they so choose. Absolutely. Okay, and but it's at their that. expense. Yes. Mm -hmm. So any hunter that harvests a deer that chooses to, and Illinois is the same way, 
if you choose to donate the animal to uh, share the harvest or one of the other organizations that are very similar, you pay the processing costs. Um, with the sharpshooter option, we are paying someone to harvest the deer, therefore okay. it is our responsibility. Under the managed hunt program, they can choose to keep the deer and utilize the meat themselves, or if they choose to donate it, it would be at their expense. Okay. I just had one other, like, just minor um, amendment to our proposed ordinance, just for consistency reasons under our subparagraph B6 for um, we have that any individual who sex successfully harvests a deer during the hunt must report by calling the Cape Girardeau Police Department. I would just, you know, later when we get to our regular session, just to amend that to um, for subparagraph E4 to change from city nuisance abatement officer to the Cape Girardeau Police Department. Yeah, we can do that, um, I believe, in first reading. Right. Any other questions? I have a few. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, you know, just about seeing this as a as a process that takes multi years, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but just be clear with everybody, we're we're approving just a one year, Correct. just a November of twenty twenty one. Correct. Correct. Okay. And you would anticipate every year needing to reapprove for now. Um, if we would ever get to a situation that we have all the properties under control uh, that we need, and you could suspend it and just do away with it. Yeah, you, you could you could just not reapprove it, right? Or you could do a multi-year, I assume. I'm, but I'm, I might point out that the ordinance, as written, does not have a time period. So I think what you're referring to is it would be re, it could be reevaluated after this hunting season. Mm -hmm. But the ordinance right now, as written, does not have a time period only for 2021. I would have to go back and look. I thought it say I'll defer to legal counsel on that one. <laughs> okay. um, Certainly, if you'd like to amend, that's that's another amendment you could offer. Make <coughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two, two other questions. Uh, you mentioned that the I'm going to paraphrase because all of my notes on that are oh. there. But essentially what it comes down to is um, we have the ability. You want that? No. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have the ability to uh, require hunters have personal liability insurance before participating in a managed hunt on our properties. Um, in speaking with the Department of Conservation, a lot of the, the St. Louis municipalities did take that route um, initially within their programs. And all of them have since eliminated it um, because there were issues with the example that was given to me, um, some individuals getting together and forming a, an LLC um, that could get uh, liability insurance. And anybody that paid a certain fee to the LLC could hunt under that plan. And it led to some not so savory hunters in there from what I was told, and it put a burden on some of our, some individuals that couldn't afford the insurance, but are still quality individuals and quality hunters. Um, it eliminated them from the program. Um, while you have others that aren't quite as good, going through a less than stellar way of getting around it, mm -hmm. if you will, um, because they couldn't get it on their own. So, we can do that if this council desires, but I would be safe to say the criminal and civil pro processes will cover us. If, if I discharge an arrow that hurts someone or I'm shooting across the road, I'm in violation of the law at that point. And again, that comes back to why the identification on the arrows there and why we're having um, the Department of Conservation and our PD checking individuals. We will be out there checking their arrows um, to ensure they're wearing a blaze orange, to make sure they're labeling their arrows, make sure their stands are labeled, following these rules. And those protocols are in place 
um, to help mitigate those problems before they get there. And then, uh, you know, does the city uh, need additional liability? Now, um, there are two pieces to that. Um, the Missouri Recreational Use Act, um, it is back there. Um, I'm going to paraphrase, and I hope I don't misquote statute, but essentially what it says is any landowner that allows the use of their property for recreational purposes free of charge, which this would be the case since we are not charging a fee for them to hunt, that is the conservation area, um, we are away for, uh, we are covered in liability. Um, hunting is one of the noted recreational uses within that regulation, and I believe it's 537.345 through 348 is the uh, is the statute on that that you can look at. Um, and then also we have our standard general liability coverages that that will also take effect too. So. We're covering on both sides. Just one quick follow-up, mm -hmm. just on what you were speaking about earlier. Um, it looks like Section C3 uh, talked about um, no arrows um, may be discharged or projected at such an angle or distance as the land basically outside of the designated area. So if they do, um, and I think people are concerned about especially if they do and they hit my dog or No, sir, we don't. Uh, we have the range of punishments that go up to a $500 fine, and we are restricted, much though we wish we were not. So could we change it, make it like $100,000? Do an order, please. Please, that's an order. Ask. Will the audience please be quiet and just listen? So that's just, that well, was you my... you may be listening a lot longer, because this is a subject that we need to talk about. That was my question, is is there flexibility for us to be able to increase these penalties? That, that's state statute. We can't affect change on those penalties. That is correct, but remember that they also are violations of the state statute, and the state statute could carry uh, significantly higher penalties than a municipal ordinance violation. This is municipal. Yes. The, the hundred of well, five hundred. As you stated, that individual throws an arrow, I'll use me for example. If I get hit with that arrow and I'm mortally wounded, that's a whole different range. That is no longer a hundred dollars. Right, right, yeah. right, right. That is a criminal charge, and also civil, civil option as well. So there, there are other avenues. Sure. Okay. Well, just, just for my sake, I was thinking, you know, in order to sort of scare people into making sure they abide by all these rules and regulations, is there a way to increase those penalties? But there's not. Okay. And that is, and that is simply for violation. Sure. As it escalates up there. As it escalates up, yeah, that's something out of our control. But and, for, again, and that's why I wanted to stress having the right numbers on these pieces of equipment. Sure. Where if that happens, that citizen should be able to pick it up and they see that number of get a hold of PD mm -hmm. and they will handle contacting conservation and we will be able to handle it from sure. there. Sure. Um, are, you, are you finished with your question? I am. Okay, just a couple of questions for you if you don't mind. Um, how involved was the Department of Conservation in putting together this concept? Very much so. Okay. Um, I would say they, and, and Scott can correct me if I'm wrong, they gave us all of our options. And they said these are the legal options, these are options we would have. Um, I did research on, on this area as a whole looking for the best opportunity to establish this program. 
And that's how I came up with those properties. Um, I had a follow-up meeting with the Department of Conservation following the completion of everything here on January 19th. And I went through this entire presentation with them. I went through all of the details and everything else. And in the end, they said this plan is done. And they're fully supportive of what we're doing here. In all of your research, um, there there are a lot of other communities that you've researched that have 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 managed hunt operations, correct? Okay. A anything surprising? Because I, I think you, in a list, once I think I saw something even like Kirkwood and other places that that you wouldn't expect for there to be managed hunt operations. Um, uh, St. Louis County, <coughs> De Pere, uh Baldwin. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of them. Uh, again, Wyoming, every town has one. Sure. Um, just because of the situation out there. So, so Cape Girardeau is not isolated in this being an issue. Um, this has been done in multiple places within the state of Missouri, other states, and about 100 managed deer hunts. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a good find, Nicolette. <laughs> um, <coughs> and all of these have been done successfully. And... If you look at some of these, they're massive, uh, with a lot of hunters, a lot of acreage, and all that other. We don't have the same setup as those do, and that's why I set it the way I did. Um, I also went against what we did in my last job with the sharpshooters, because this area is not conducive to that. In Rollins, Wyoming, USA, it is conducive for that plan. This plan is conducive for Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and if you look through the lists of all those all those different uh, all those different municipalities, taxing districts, whatever counties, you will find everybody does things just a little different. I believe there are five or six different permit uh, quotes, meaning some are three, some are one, some are two, some you can kill two does and get one buck, etc. Everybody has a different structure. What I was trying to do was fit a plan that fits Cape Girardeau um, with this, to the best of my ability. Um, did, when, in all your conversations with MDC, did anybody have any concerns about our herd, our urban deer herd? Is there any disease or, or any other questionable impacts right now? They had no concerns on the disease side. Okay. Um, I know during conversation with them, um, under this plan, they would, during the firearms portion of those seasons that we will be hosting um, or during the non-firearm season, they will give the option to call in and come in during standard business hours for option of testing if someone's available, but they're not going to require it, which tells me they're not concerned about our herd. Okay. If that makes sense. But they didn't, exp there wasn't anything explicitly like, oh, the, the Cape Girardeau herd is in danger because of its own genetic makeup or, um, or other they, communicable They disease. never said anything to me, and, and I'll okay. refer to Scout if he heard anything, but I don't recall them. Cool. Uh, you know, I just in general am pretty tenuous about this because the majority of these hunt areas fall within Ward 1. Mm -hmm. And it just puts, gives me a lot of pause seeing those, those parks and other natural areas kind of lit up like that. And it just, Makes me cautious because we've got, you know, decent amounts of population density in Ward 1, but we also have some open tracts of land, and it just sort of just, just gives me a lot of question, a lot of concern. The hearing about their concerns about this. Anybody else? I'll let you go first. I got one, too. Do you plan to work with Parks and Rec to make sure that these areas in Ward 1 are cleared? with all individuals and cordoned off appropriately? And how yeah. do you and, and we'll, do we'll that? And we'll involve PD in that as well. Okay, are they gonna, like how, how far in advance before the hunt period are they planning on doing this to make sure that there's nobody in there? That's gonna be a situation that's gonna be, the, the weeks leading up to it, we'll probably have to do some walking through, especially the PD, and I know uh, in speaking with Ty, he is very familiar with the properties in okay. different Things there, that go on there, yeah. and, and I think we can work through that pretty well, and um, just make sure the hunters are aware during orientation that if you see somebody that's not supposed to be there because these are closed properties, contact them immediately, and they will take care of it. So. And I think the concern is that we have a homeless population that frequents those areas, and that we need to make sure that 
they are identified and removed from that area and, and placed somewhere else in, to safety. So that is a concern. And I think I would rather have the <coughs> PD handle that than Parks and Rec. Right. But, so. Yeah. Yep. Nate? Uh, this issue was brought forward by a citizen, or, or this concern was by, or citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I approach it as addressing that concern. Um, if we were to address it or take action on it, I look at what the benefits of that are and the, the costs and the risks mm -hmm. of that as well um, of taking action. So then on the flip side, which you've done a great job, uh, a great job with your analysis comprehensively, um, as well as then I look at if we don't take action, what mm -hmm. is the, the costs and the benefits of that, which we have. Um, and at the risk of being leading or rhetorical, um, I feel like it wasn't mentioned very much, was what are the benefits to the city of Cape Girardeau or to Cape Girardeau citizens to not taking action and allowing the population to stay as is or the population growth to remain as is undeterred by taking action? That is an option. Absolutely. What are the benefits uh, to it? Uh, Growing up on a farm, um, as population numbers increase, um, I have seen two rounds of distemper in raccoons. It is a nasty disease, but it starts because of overpopulation. Um, we have found deadheads on my family's farm um, that were likely caused by CWD um, or a blue tongue or one of the, one of the many diseases they get. Um, you don't like seeing it. Um, typically, controlling the population is the best method to do that. There are options um, that are non-lethal. They are options, and, and you can do an educational program um, explaining what deer-resistant plants are. Um, you can explain what kind of repellents you can get, um, the fencing options. We can do all those things. Those are options. They're not going to lower your population period. Um, and that's just not, what, safe to that's say not that. what they're done. That's not what they're made for. Let me say it that way. That's not what they're made to do. Um, and those are options. But one piece I want to ensure is known is in every one of these options I put in front of you and non-lethal solutions are one of the options I'm showing you and being open about. None of them are 100% when it comes to public safety. I'll be 100% honest, there's going to be people that disagree with me. But sharpshooters wasn't a good option because I don't want firearms and I don't want a bullet ricochet. Um, I don't feel trapping euthanasia is safe because what if you get a kid caught in one of those traps and can't get back home? Because when they go running around playing, you know, and I don't really want to see a kid get hurt or, or anything like that. Um, managed hunt has risks. If, uh, if an arrow ricochets, it still has a risk to the public. Um, the, the open archery hunt, same principle. But when you look at the non-lethal solutions, those have risks to public safety as well that we need to consider and look at the deer vehicle collisions that we have on the screen. Um, personal experience, when I was younger, I know an individual that was a couple years younger than me in grade school never came back to school. I didn't know, I didn't find out till later. It was because she was coming home from Walmart with her mom the car in front of him hit a deer, it rolled over the top and came through the windshield and killed her. That can happen. Um, I understand that maybe not at 35 miles an hour, but it does happen. Um, you catch the wrong male during mating season or the wrong female during birthing season, they may kick you, that, they may beat you up pretty good. <coughs> you may get gored. So, there is no option that is 100% perfect when it comes to public safety, unfortunately. I wish I could, I could wave a magic wand and give you a perfect answer. No, no, no. My, my question was, what, is, it, is there a benefit to the community of doing nothing? They can continue to watch the deer, and I know there are members of the public that thoroughly enjoy that. And, and that is a big thing. So I'm not going to discount their opinion on that. Um, I think that's a fair opinion, but... They're going to continue to tear up the grass, tear up the trees, cause vehicle accidents. But, yeah. 
Thank you. Right. Sorry, I didn't that's mean the, to put you on the spot. That's the best I could come yeah. up with uh, yeah. on that one. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions for Dustin? I want to thank you for a great, thorough presentation. Absolutely. And thank the council for a great discussion, some great questions. Uh, thank the citizens for questions they ask us that we passed on to you. And uh, I think it was very well covered. I appreciate it very much. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is appearances by advisory board applicants. And I think there are a couple of them here this evening. Chatez? The nice thing about having a, a sign-in sheet, I know who everybody is. <laughs> How's it going today? Good. Good. How are you? Good. I'm doing well, thank you. My name is Chatez Robinson, and I live at 402 South Dallas. I come to you today, city council members, asking you to consider my application for the vacancy on the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. I feel that I am a good candidate for this position because, I mean, I bring an open-mindedness. Um, I don't look the same as everybody else. Um, I have a different perspective than most, and I'm willing to learn. And most importantly, like, here within the last two years, Serving my community was just like something in the back of my head that I always felt like that I would do like later on in life when I was like more settled in my career and everything like that. But life has its twists and turns where you can just take you anywhere. So now within the past two years, it just became a goal of mine and now it's a priority. So basically what I'm looking to do with this position is just basically contribute to Cape Girardeau in the best positive way that I can. And with my perspective, learning from everybody else around me. I feel like I can do that. So, I mean, I know I'm young and everybody has their reservations about people being young. I know what Mr. Charlie said. I heard him. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> the commitment thing, the school, like, I get it. I am a full-time student right now. I'm pursuing my undergraduate at CMO right now, criminal justice, of course. But yeah, I'm committed to this. I'm committed to this process. I want to see what comes after and do my part to help Cape Girardeau. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Can't Ward? Can't. Good How evening. You How you do, sir? I'm fine. My name is Kent Ward. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come before Mayor Fox and the council this evening. Um, I'm here in regards to the vacancy on the Parks and Rec Board, obviously. I'm a resident of Cape Girardeau and have been since 1986. I attended Notre Dame High School in Southeast Missouri State. My wife, Jennifer, is an RN at Southeast Hospital in Cape and has been for 22 years. I have two children, age 12 and 10, Parker and Braden, and they attend St. Vincent's DePaul Elementary School. Back in 2007 and 8, I served on the golf course advisory board for a while. Um, regrettably, some health issues, I had to cut that term short. But during that time, I got to uh, help with the campaign to get the half, half, half cent sales tax increase passed. And I had a good time with that. That was a lot of fun. Spent some evenings up at Danny Esner's office <laughs> on, the, on the phone making some calls and trying to get some positive uh, feedback from that. And uh, <clears throat> since then, you know, I, I've become a father. I have two kids, obviously. Uh, and I'm involved in Cape Youth Sports. I coach uh, basketball and baseball, so there's not many weeks I'm not at the sportsplex for many hours or the, the baseball fields, and I've enjoyed all of that. I think that what makes me a good candidate is my skill set for business. Um, I can bring that to the to the t to the table um, if you. Excuse me, if selected, you could expect me to dedicate my time and my energy to the position, and uh, I won't be scared to roll up my sleeves and get things done. All right. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
I don't think there's anybody else here for advisory boards. Uh, any appearances uh, for anything that is not on the agenda this evening? Any appearances for anything not on the agenda? If not, we'll move into agenda review. Scott? Uh, thank you, Mayor. We have um, a public hearing tonight uh, for rezoning of 1246 and 1248 Meadowbrook Lane uh, from an M2 to an M1. So we'll be uh, having that public hearing tonight. And then we have on our consent agenda, we have um, some second and third readings. The first one is an item number, th uh, item number three for the abatement of nuisance um, on Henderson Street. This is some boarding up uh, enclosure of some buildings uh, uh, that uh, we need to get uh, the abatement uh, in the tax bill. Um, Number four is stop signs. Remember, we uh, did that uh, new stop signs primarily in, in uh, subdivi new subdivisions, uh, but we do had, did add one at uh, Bloomfield in Minnesota, uh, going from a part-time four-way to all the time four-way stop. And then we have the uh, par no parking at any time in those other subdivisions. That's number five. Number six will be the performance guarantee for Rock Garden <coughs> subdivision. <coughs> Uh, seven is a performance guarantee for the locks of Dalhousie, phase five. Uh, eight is a performance guarantee for Touchdown Ridge. So it's that time of year when we're getting those uh, performance guarantees as they're uh, people getting ready to uh, start construction. Uh, number nine is the housing agreement for the Humane Society. This is our yearly agreement with them. It contains a 2% increase uh, in the uh, contribution to the Humane Society uh, for the work that they do. Uh, number 10 is the author's, is the acceptance of snow removal equipment out at the airport. And 11 appoints uh, Dustin Zebold as our city treasurer pursuant uh, to our ordinance. So that's uh, an appointment you need to do tonight. Is there any um, of those items you'd like to remove from consent agenda or um, make any other claims? No. Okay. All right. Uh, our new ordinances, we have uh, just three. We have... Uh, First reading of the rezoning for the hearing uh, on Meadowbrook, and then we have the um, reading of the urban deer hunting ordinance. Um, I know you have a couple of uh, sounded like you had a couple of um, amendments you wanted to make on that, so uh, we'll entertain those at uh, the time of that first reading. And then uh, number fourteen is a amendment to chapter twenty-five of the Cody ordinances regarding administrative re relief and acceptance. Uh, this is a. <clears throat> this will allow us to uh, make uh, administrative relief for exceptions um, due to uh, where we are buying property or getting easements for property in our construction projects. Oftentimes, we'll sit down with a business and they'll, um, as part of that that uh, negotiations, uh, they need to have administrative relief, say, to have less parking spots than is below. Our requirement and so in the past we would have to then take that to and through the entire process and you know our, our plan and zoning and uh, Board of Adjustments is very good to to make those uh, adjustments but uh, this will allow us to do it administratively now it does not you know it does not waive our ability just to do it uh, we we have to still go through all the same questions that we submit to them uh, we have to confirm that that it does meet the, that standard and then we can document that and we'll let also those boards know that we've done that administratively. So um, this just is, uh, uh, allows us to be a little more streamlined in those discussions and, um, and, and do it uh, in, a, uh, in a more uh, <clears throat> streamlined way and, and fashion. So that's what we're asking for in number 14. Um, then we have the appointments to the tree board tonight. Uh, um, and uh, I believe uh, if you have any, don't have any other business, then we have no closed session tonight. So I believe that's all, Mayor. Okay. At this point, we'll move into regular session. Special call the session to order. And a roll call. Bob Fox. Here. Robbie Gard. Here. Stacy Kinder. Here. Shelley Moore. Here. Dan Presson. Here. Nate Thomas. Here. Shannon Truxell. Here. 
I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Dan, second by Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. We have one public hearing tonight. A public hearing to consider the request to rezone property at 1246 and 1248 Meadowbrook Lane from M2 Heavy Manufacturing Industrial District to M1 Light Manufacturing Industrial District. Anybody here this evening to speak no. on behalf of the public hearing? I don't even think they showed up. We don't see anyone, so I will close the public hearing. Okay, appearances regarding items on the agenda this evening. Good evening. Um, thank you um, for um, answering a lot of the questions that I sent you earlier, um, asking those questions. There's a I, know, I know we know you, would you please state your name so it's yes, on the record. Yes, uh -huh. Renita Green. Um, so I have a few more questions, some things that weren't um, answered. In Section B1, it says that this um, policy applies to archery devices. Um, it is limited to hunting and target shooting is permitted under this ordinance. And so my question is, what are the rules for target shooting? Where does target shooting happen? Is that happening on the public property? Is that happening at people's homes? I think that bears some conversation there. That should not have been in there, Renita. Okay. Um, and then archery devices is a vague term. Other cities, and maybe I'll start by telling you that I've read about 10 different cities ordinances before I came here tonight. So I won't remember exactly who said what, but um, a lot of the other ordinances defined what archery devices were. Um, also did research on what archery devices are because I didn't really know so much. Um, but there are air-powered archery devices, and those are not recommended to be used within city limits. And some ordinances that are written by communities exclude air-powered, specifically exclude those. So that might be something to consider. Um, Excuse me, the term, uh, those terms are, uh, Renita, are defined in, uh, in section, I believe it's 17-94. Oh, okay. That is already in the code right now. Oh, okay. Is that just not part of this? Yeah, it's just not part of oh. this because this is just changes. I see. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, and number five, it spe specifies um, the hunting permits. The MDC also has um, special archery permits. And my recommendation would be that people would have to have an archery permit in addition to their hunting permit. You, you, you have to. I'm sorry. You have to. You have to, because that's not stated in here. Well, it's part of the state of Missouri's law. Whenever you, I can have a hunting permit. Sorry, uh -huh. I can have a hunting permit, but to also do archery you or gun, to. I mm -hmm. have to have one of those specific. Okay. Sorry, I just that's okay. When I Dustin? talked to her at the thing today, she made it sound like it was Dustin? optional. Go ahead. So sometimes we get some terms intermingled. Mm -hmm. There's a Mm -hmm. that we obtain and then a hunting permit, which mm -hmm. is for deer specific. The hunting license is open so you have a small game and a large game right. license. The, the license is what authorizes you to go pursue game, but you need the actual deer hunting permit, which is a separate item to chase or to pursue white-tailed deer. And then for the managed hunt, there is an actual hunting permit specific, specifically for those dates mm -hmm. and locations. Right, and, so, she, and then she said that you have to like turn that in. It's only for good for that date and like the and number of deer or something, right? Yes. But then there's an archery license, an archery permit that you can get as well. Yeah, it's through the Missouri valid. Department of Con Conservation. Those are not those valid are terms. Outside city those are outside city limits. This is a managed term. So we don't need to have people. You do not. Certify. Okay. Um, number six, 
Um, no, we answered that. Let me go down. Um, number eight, this paragraph where it says that it will, um, about the parking. Other communities also require that the vehicles have in their windshields a sign that says hunting in progress. That's already taken care of with a, a decal they have to have on their dashboard. Okay. I didn't see that in writing here. Um, <coughs> and number nine, other communities about where they're to stand. Other communities have specifically, like almost every other ordinance specifically says that it doesn't require doesn't allow for the standing on vehicles. So I don't know if that's like a thing for hunters to stand on vehicles to elevate themselves to shoot. Not in Southeast Missouri. So, yeah. Okay. So that's, um, they have to be on a stand 10 feet above the ground. Okay. So it was, it was just interesting that all the other communities had that specifically. So, you know, if that was a thing that maybe we should consider that. Um, Those questions were answered. Thank you for um, lifting the issue of the homeless um, population. As I sent that to you, um, clearing the property a week before the hunt would probably not suffice if we want to make sure that we're not accidentally hunting our unsheltered friends. We'd probably have to, you know, like check it the night before, the day before something, and put like hunting in progress. I mean, they're used to seeing no trespassing signs. There will that, be there will be signs that say hunting in progress. Okay. Um, number two of subsection C. Um, other communities specify um, how many yards away from a vehicle, dwelling house, church, school, playground, and the average was about 200 yards. So I think it would be helpful to have that inserted. And number five with the age. The way this is written, um, I mean, we already talked about that some, but te technically the way this is written, a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old could be out hunting together. Um, so if we specify that um, the, the language in the ordinance from 2012 said that anyone under the age of 18 would have to be with a parent or guardian and, and only on 10 acres if the hunt was on 10 acres. Um, and other policies, other communities um, have a, an age of 21 to be able to hunt. So that's something to think about. And then if it's the younger person under the age of 18 hunting, I would, I'm, I'm like totally new to hunting culture and was really surprised that like 11 year olds can get hunting permits. So theoretically, if this 11 year old is going out with an 18 year old, is the 11 year old also a hunter? And so is that like two hunters on one permit? And is that the intent? And if not, is there some way of like maybe, you know, working with that language so that we don't have 11 year olds out hunting with their big brothers or sisters or something? So um, the language prior did state a parent or guardian. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what it didn't say was um, hunter certified. Individual. Mm -hmm. I felt for the sake of safety, I would rather have an eight year old that's under certified and went through the proper program sure. than a parent or guardian that's never. Sure. Even but if we're writing it. the language, then we can say that, right? We can say a hunter certified parent or guardian. Yes, we can control okay. the language. Um, Excuse me, I might point out that on that place that you're referring to in C5, mm -hmm. it talks about the 18 years old individual. And then it says, unless such person is in the immediate presence of a properly licensed adult hunter who is at least 18 years of age or older and has in his possession that certification. Mm -hmm. So an 11 year old certified uh, could not accompany the 18 year old that was not. So that language is covered there, it appears to. So the 11 year old who has a hunter. It would, the person would have to be 18, more than 18 more than and 18. be certified to accompany the other 18 year old. Okay, so nobody under the 18 can be out hunting. No. Oh, okay. Um, well, with, unless you are with the, the other person the that other is 18 or more that is certified. Right, so an 11 year old could be with an 18 year old. Yes. All certified. They all have to be certified. 
the one person that is 11 would not necessarily have to be as long as they were with somebody that was 18 or older that was right. certified. I'm saying the 18-year-old's got to be certified. But right. by definition, the 11 year old's not going to be the hunter. They're just going with that their dad. That's the question. Are they the hunter? The, the, the underage individual can be the hunter. Mm -hmm. But, well, they could be as long as they had passed all of the rules and regulations to hunt in the state of Missouri to begin with. Well, I think we're going to change that. So anyway. we can control. Yeah, we, we have been discussing. <laughs> We've been discussing that sidebar. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's I'm um, definitely. Yeah. Okay, I already said about the archer educate. Oh, did I mention the archer educate and D one, um, the hunter education. The um, MDC said that they the last time this came up that they had an archer education program, but then since the it, got turned over, nobody ever took part in it, but maybe utilizing their archery education program for people who are hunting in urban areas. Um, you know, I realize that things might be different when they're hunting, when people are hunting in outside of urban areas, but we're talking about people hunting in our communities. And I think that upping the requirements and making it a little bit more stringent is acceptable. Um, and then, and then I added in, um, the liability insurance, Manchester, Missouri added that in as well. Um, I heard what, what the conversation was. Um, I just, you know, if a person or property is damaged and then they have to pursue the civil suit against it. That's putting the burden on the person who was damaged. If the person who is the damager is carrying the liability insurance, then they're responsible for making sure that the damage they cause is taken care of. When we rent a stinking park shelter, we got to carry a million dollars liability insurance. So we're talking about people hunting on city property and you know, like this is a lot more dangerous than anything we do at the park shelter. So. I don't think that this is an unrealistic thing to consider. Um, and then I was cons I was curious about what happens with the deer retrieval. So if a deer is injured and it's not retrieved, then what happens with it? Is it just like running around injured? And then what if it like it does it just eventually die somewhere out there? It happened. Yeah. Is that just? I mean, I, I just don't know. Is that what happens? And then it just kind of like the carcass rots out there. Some of them. Oh, just, usually there are many coyotes around that take care of that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what. And that's currently what's happening yeah. with them. Yeah. Okay. And so that's this, what the issue. That was yeah. just a question. I just, you know. Yeah. So the field cleaning thing really gave me a lot of pause, and I wasn't really sure. I thought I knew what it was, and I pulled up a YouTube video, and that's really not what you want to see. Uh, it's not exciting footage. So I'm wondering why that has to happen on the public land, you know, in the, in the out in the, the open like that. Is there a reason why deer can't be taken back to the person's house to be gutted and cleaned? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I understand that, uh, Stacy. But um, but but other policies have kind of strict have um, specified what is supposed to happen with the deer. Um, innards and um, once one community um, had a provision for them to be buried in the ground but every other one talked about making sure that they were removed um, and that was specifically in the ordinance so ours doesn't say anything about that but you know with this being public land you know having I might I don't know, that's I might point out that in F2, it says any person who kills any deer while hunting shall not field dress the deer in a public or conspicuous location. So it does say that. So does that specifically mean that they're supposed to not clean it on the public land? Yeah, that word public might be misleading. This, this is, is public land. Well, right. I think easily viewable. I think that's what they're meaning. Field dress the animal 
able to possible prevent any type of disease that's going to Is that like there's a, that's why I was wondering, is there like a reason you have to do that right away? Yes, and it needs to stay as cold as possible. So there are, the MDC has specific rules and regulations about field dressing that aren't actually identified in this ordinance, but they mm -hmm. are on the website that are easy to look at. Um, and then maybe if we just added something about the removal of the, the stuff that they clean up, I don't know. I mean, that's in all the other policies. So it's it just, yeah. I don't think it's necessary, but, but generally, if you don't, you leave it behind. It gets eaten? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Possums. Yeah. How many okay. possums do you see around this city? Okay. How many raccoons? Okay. Okay. That, I'm, that's, I'm tired. Like, this is not my field, so this is not my field here. <laughs> I don't need to know that my meat ever had a live body. Neither. Because, I didn't know, man. <laughs> so, now, I'm almost, I only have two more things. So, the interference um, under G. So, um, to add a three. Um, other policies have in it transportation of the deer from the hunt site to wherever they're going. And it says, like, no, transportation should be done unless the deer is covered. And it, there's some language that talks about specifically with a tarp or something like that. So, you know, maybe that bears some. I don't think that's a big deal. Really? No. It's okay to just, like, take a gutted deer across town? It's already happening. It's already happening. Our, I've seen him at gas stations. Have to haul the animals that are dead on the back of their trucks without being covered all the way across the town. Okay, okay. different world, world. <laughs> different different stuff. Okay. Um, and then back to the penalties. I actually had already a note there, and I understand if this is a municipal. Pen, these are municipal penalties, but if they're municipal pen, penalties, then it seems like isn't there some way? I mean, we're the <coughs> municipal, right? So. Can the state tells us how much those have to the be. State, the state governs the municipal penalties? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so these were the exact same as what they were in 2012, so they've not increased since 2012? Eric, just, just the opposite. They've done, <laughs> just, they they've done just the opposite, and they've made it very, very difficult for cities to enforce their ordinances. Wow. Okay. So... And then my final thing is that we there was conversation several times about this being for just one year, but there's no end date on this. And I think, you know, I know we don't get to vote on this, but, you know, like having that this is good for one year or and we're reevaluating it or, I, you know, I don't even know if that's, you know, in terms of the legalities of how um, ordinance language is written, but when you say it's going to be for a year and then it's not it's not written that way it kind of doesn't look like the intent is for it to really just be a year and that you know we're we not, know that we've talked about that already and um and then finally i'm i will just say that i am not comfortable with urban hunting i you know I, I, part of that is coming from the place of not being a hunter and just you know having those kinds of apprehensions because I don't have those experiences. But I think urban hunting is a slippery slope. I was a lot more comfortable when I saw the areas that are defined um, for the hunting, but I will never be in favor of us hunting in Kappa Hall Park and Arena Park and those areas, those more highly populated areas. No, I, neither will we. And so I'm, you know, and just seeing conversation that has happened is, is going back and forth. There are people who think that that's where the hunting should take place because the deer population is more populated in that area. But um, if this passes, um, I'm sure that there would be a referendum to overturn it if we started to move out into the more populated areas. Watch your coffee can. Uh, who's next? Go ahead. Good evening. I'm here with Randall McLean. Hi, Randall. Thanks for putting up with us. Uh, no problem. Most of you, most of the people here at the city of Cape know me by Mac. I worked for the city for 42 years. I read the article in the paper, uh, and I understand why you're starting to hunt on the east side of Cape. I brought these 
from my home. I live at 3619 Julie Drive. These are deer in my father-in-law's backyard at 402 Lorraine. These are deer in my father-in-law's yard in 402 Lorraine and in the area that we live in. This was recently when it snowed and this was before the snow melted. There's close to 20 deer right there. I know. This one decided to lay down in my backyard last year and just stay there for a while. I've actually had them walk up and look into the window at me at night while I've been watching TV. Uh, they are everywhere. Uh, they have they put off my uh, doorbell alarm every night. Do they? Okay. I know. Uh, they have destroyed uh, <coughs> several flower beds in the area. Uh, the bucks have racked the trees to the point that I have lost uh, two uh, Japanese maples, crepe myrtles, and I don't know how many other plants and, and things that my wife has planted. Uh, they do like to eat her knockout roses when they bloom that are right there at my back door. Uh, they leave tracks everywhere. Uh, they eat new grass when it's planted. Um, we can't have a garden in the neighborhood because once it starts to come up, they eat it all. Uh, I have seen as many in the field behind my house as 35 deer at one time. The field that borders my home, you, everybody sees it when they go on the interstate going north there at Route K. That's the 12 acres that the Kirchdorfer zone and maintain and farm. Some years it's in corn, some years it's in soybeans, some years there's winter wheat in it, and some years it's in hay. I have spoke to both Joe and Eddie Kirchdorfer about the problem. The deer are tearing up their field. They'd like to see them gone. Uh, I have a handwritten proposal for Dustin to give to Dustin this evening. If he wants it or I'll have it typed up and then bring it to him. I did not have time to get that done. But uh, they are willing to let seasoned hunters hunt that area during the time that the city specifies. They are also willing to cooperate with the conservation agency in any way and form. It is a 12 acre plot of ground. There are no houses around. There are no kids around. Uh, the closest house is mine, uh, Kevin Bulow's and Jeff Cox's house. We border the property that runs all the way to uh, Vantage Drive. Uh, myself, uh, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, my other brother-in-law, and his son, we are all seasoned veteran hunters. We are all well over the age of 20 years old. Uh, <laughs> myself being almost 65 now, my father-in-law being 81, and my brother-in-law being 60. Uh, all of us are very seasoned hunters. We know the Kirchdorfers very well. They would agree to let us hunt that ground, put the stands up, and then take them down after December 5th. Um, we would uh, follow the city's guidelines, the conservation's guidelines, and take does. Uh, the doe population there in the area that I live in is enormous. This past year, I watched three does bring out twin fawns, six deer plus fawns, all at one time in the field. Uh, if this continues, the population in that area is going to become enormous. With the building of Veterans Memorial Drive, the Hunsey Farm being subdivisioned out now, and the push down on the west side of town, especially with MoDOT taking out the trees there along the interstate, the deer are pushing harder and harder into our neighborhood. Uh, I've seen in Dr. Roop's driveway 15 deer at one time at the end of Ferrar Drive. Uh, we, as family members, we have property that we hunt that belongs to us. That's outside of Cape Girardeau. But we'd also like to be able to maintain our yards and take care of our property. And at this rate, the deer in that area are just overrunning. I, I will tell you that there are many, many areas in Cape in the center of town that are just as bad. Yes, sir, I do know that. And we are, <coughs> we are attempting to begin to control this population with a managed hunt, 
starting on a small scale, seeing how it goes. We evaluate it after the first year and see. Yes, sir. And we'll move forward. It could be that in future years we we could expand that to other areas. Right. But let us start small first. Well, that's and let why us be and let's keep the public safety in mind first. Always, always, sir. I'm a, I'm a very safe hunter. Uh, I understand that, you but, know, I, but I don't. I don't want to start this uh, this 12 acres or the, or the property or any other hunt until uh, the city is, is assured of what they're doing at this point in time. My proposal to give to Dustin is for future use and future to look at. Okay, okay? that'd be good. That's all it's intended. Okay. Um, as it is written, uh, it's very short. If you want, I can read it to you. Um, and what I'm proposing is that if a landowner who is willing to let seasoned and qualified bow hunters specified by name by the landowner hunt his or her property in cooperation with the city and the Department of Conservation and following all guidelines set by bow hunt said property. Hunting on these properties would only be during November 1st through December 5th with each specified hunter only hunting seven days. If the property owner does not have five qualified hunters to fill the weeks, then those weeks would be closed and no hunting would be permitted on that property that week. Hunters would have to follow the set guidelines of taking one doe and then one any deer permit. Uh, yeah, any hunter not specified by the landowner caught hunting that area will be reported to the proper authorities. Hunters must provide their own stands, and those stands must be 10 feet or higher off the ground. No blinds permitted. All stands must be removed after December 5th by the hunters. No permit, permanent stands are to be built on the owner's property. I under, you don't have to read all okay. of it to us. If, you, if you'll give that to us, yes. give it to Dustin, yes. uh, we'll oh, keep God. it for future use, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks, Appreciate it. How's Good retirement? Call. You didn't hear me. Uh, Miss Bonnie? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. You know my name. <laughs> I know you. You look a little different than when you were yes, here last. I do, don't I? Uh, deer didn't, a deer Simpson. didn't knock you down, did it? Uh, it is deer. <laughs> it is deer related. Oh, no, it's not. Um, uh, in in a in a roundabout way, um, Bonnie Coy Svensson, one five zero six Price Drive, uh, Ward One. And um, Dan, you will be hearing from me. And um, I I um I love that you all are are doing are, are at least bringing this up in a reasonable you know a thorough uh, safe you know uh, way. Um, you all heard my talk back in October where I brought up all most of those same points that that uh, is it Dustin Dustin yeah yeah that, that was wonderful. I really had no clue about the bird flyway thing. That was super cool to know that they are also getting impacted. Um, again, we, we, they eat so much down and then the invasives come in and, and then all those other little critters that also, you know, probably have nice little names like Thumper and, uh, Rocky and you know, those little critters don't have any food either. Uh, of course we know the E. coli. Um, there, years ago, there were a few things going on, like in strawberry patches and stuff, um, you know, out west. Um, there's no reason why E. coli couldn't be then in the gardeners, you know, in your own home backyard. And as Mr. McLean said, um, the gardening thing is huge, the landscaping thing, and especially now, um, with COVID, everyone knows that like the, the incident of getting pets, you know, went up, that everybody went and adopted pets. But my husband being the professor of horticulture and me also being a horticulturalist, um, we know for a fact that the greenhouse sales went up and um, also throughout the United States because we have nursery contacts. And so then I'm just waiting for all those poor people who spent a ton of money for landscapes to just then get so discouraged that they got eaten down. And um, 
you know, I just can't say it again. I, I'm thrilled that y'all are, are trying this and I'm more than willing to, to, cause ward one is my ward. I am gonna probably hopefully be impacted the most. Um, I also do agree with some of the non-lethal ways too, like more signage, except for, of course, that's more for us because, you know, the deer can't read. So, <laughs> you know, whenever they make those little things where the, the cougars or other things in other states, you know, they don't necessarily go under the overpass, you know, I mean, but they are still a nuisance. And yes, my leg is a testament to it. We adopted um, a new dog. He's a three-year-old Basset Hound and he has no command knowledge or anything. And so about 6 a.m. on January 20th, he was out in the yard and he wasn't coming back to me like I wanted to. And it was 28 degrees. And of course, I was just in my you know sleep clothes and a robe and my plastic gardening clogs and I did slip and I broke my leg. But what the reason that I was even going towards him was because I couldn't get him away from my eight foot fence that planning and zoning so nicely approved this past summer that cost just slightly under $10,000 um, because there was, <laughs> there was a deer on the other side of the fence. Oh, no. And so, <laughs> so yes, indirectly the deer did do this. But that's because I have now put up this eight foot fence and now they've chosen to go a different way and now they're annoying a different neighbor that has been complaining. So I'm just thrilled that y'all are doing this. That's all. And again, it's, um, a, be it's a beginning. It's a beginning, it exactly. And safety is always priority. I have a question about this survey that y'all had out front. Yes. Is this something that you want returned tonight or is this for a future? It's, like you want them mailed back? It, it's an online survey it's that online I think you survey. just laid some copies out there. Yes. Well, just I'm together, just, just together input. And when do you want it returned by? Uh, I don't know, Nicolette, did you put a date on that when we put it on, on the... Before your next meeting, so you would have time to act on any... Okay, okay, okay. All right, certainly, I can, I can certainly um, get people to do that, because um, one last thing, you know, um, I'm on Keep Cape Beautiful with Shannon, and um, the reason we planted all those daffodils back in fall um, was because deer don't eat daffodils. Okay, that was number one. Number two, I'm on the garden, I'm with garden clubs. And what are we doing at Cap Hall Park? We're redesigning the rose garden. We're not even gonna call it a rose garden anymore because we can't have roses because of the deer issue. Um, no, I don't agree shooting in Cap Hall Park either. We have to, you know, thin from the outside and hopefully those ones that are inside will you know, eventually just pass away. But um, the, the the new plan for Kappa, and now we have to be thinking of plants that are deer resistant, which we know are not necessarily. So that's going to be an expense in itself, is looking up all that stuff. Not that there's great lists out there, but I am thrilled. And that's all. Just thank you, and I'll make sure we get right. a few back to thank you. Thank you. And, you know, thanks for recognizing me. <laughs> <laughs> Keith? You just sit back there so patiently and fidgety, and you just can't wait to get up here and talk. I know it. Yeah, well, this isn't the first time I've been up here. I think last time I was here, he on city council. I remember going through this before. And at that point, my name's Keith Lear. I live 1829 uh, Old Sprig Street Road. I also own the adjoining park property, 1833 Old Sprig Street Road. Uh, my property abuts the Renfro's, and I think when you see your chart there, I'm pretty much right on the southern part of your biggest area where all the deer are. Um, and I was with the Cape, the Keep Cape Safe Amendment you know, initiative thing that we had back in 2012. Uh, so obviously I don't think hunting deer is a good idea, but I'm not going to deny that we definitely probably need to look at it. Uh, get an, a realistic count, you know. I, I, I'm not, I also wanted to say thank this gentleman right here for an extensive amount of work that he did. And a lot of that was the same stuff that we saw that you guys did prior to this. So I just want to say thank you for that. And thank you guys for letting me come up here and talk to y'all. Um, I've lived there for over 20 years uh, down in this area. I I've seen, oh gosh, probably 10 sets of double fawns come out of the woods out there in Renfro. They're beautiful. 
nothing like coming across them sitting in the grass in the morning. I don't, we don't deny they're God's creatures, they're beautiful. And I've, you know, I've uh, driven around in that area for, I lived right up on Mason Street for a number of years, so I've driven in this area of town extensively for 25 years, pretty much as long as I've lived here. As, as, as a matter of fact, I think I'm actually driving your 1998 Jimmy. Good I bought it from Bob White down at, uh, at, down, down at the dealership down from Blotner. Um, I've been fortunate. I've only actually clipped one deer once my entire time. Now. But I've You're lucky because I clipped three of them in 2018. Well, and, and, and actually it was kind of misleading, mis misleading the article because they made it sound like you were just sitting in there and they struck your vehicle. Well, no. You know, so, I mean, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it wasn't that way, but it's kind of a, I can't see you sitting at the stop sign and just all of a sudden, wham! You know, I, no. just, I don't think that's the way it works. But well, I understand that. Um, there's no doubt we need to do something. Um, I just, the problem I have with it and it's the same problem I had eight years ago when I was here, bow hunting. Uh, it's extremely ineffective. Uh, you know, depending on the statistics you look at, I went back online again today and looked and, you know, hunting organizations will say that, oh my gosh, you know, you hit a deer pretty much every time they die. You know, and all the ones that do go, they are recovered. Now, they recovered, that means that the hunter who shot it actually found it, not someone the next day by a creek in their yard saw a dead deer. So these numbers are kind of, you know, you don't know. You can go to the animal rights things and they say, oh, you know, one out of two deer. You know, you know, they never get, they always drunk. You know, you never kill them. So you can't really take the statistics. You gotta take a grain of salt with them, you know. I'd like to see you guys seriously do something as far as counting the number, establishing a realistic thing. If 80 is gonna be the max that, that, that we're looking at, that's fine. You know, you're going to have one guy go out there. He can get two deer. So that's 40 tags you're going to give out a year for 80 deer. I mean, I, I don't see at that rate, it's going to be 50 years before we're reducing the population, you know, on the very outskirts of town. Um, I think a more appropriate <coughs> way of doing it would be to hire someone to come in and take them out effectively, humanely, Sanely, I just can't see a bunch of amateurs running around public land with a crossbow shooting, 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 shooting. Eventually it's going to die. That's the ones that they chase after. Now, the ones that they don't chase after that run off onto another piece of property, well, I mean, I don't know. There's another aspect for me on this. One is the effect of this. And two, and this wasn't one we really looked at before, was when there's going to be someone, I don't have my phone with me, but when there's someone out there and that deer comes running through the yard with three bows, arrows sticking out of it, and that person goes on Facebook and goes, I'm posting that on social media. And we got a group of people driving down the interstate who are going to spend their disposable tax dollars, disposable dollars on tourist money here in Cape Girardeau. They're going to say, let's see what kind of town Cape is. Well, here's a bunch of guy got a fucking funk, 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 shooting deer and people shooting, shooting deers with arrows in the city limits. Let's go to Perryville, see what they're doing. You know, this gentleman right here, Mr. Thomas, asked, "What are the benefits of having deer?" Um, couldn't really come up with any. They're pretty. I don't know. There's 175 acres located on the north side of Cape Girardeau for sale in this very area where all these deer are. Maybe we could put something new for Cape Girardeau. This is the best we can come up with, is all we can do is kill them. Maybe we charge $10 for people to come feed them deer corn. And we make some tax dollars for Cape Girardeau. <laughs> you know, as opposed to the 40 people you're gonna get to spend their tax dollars, to spend their money here and go to shooters, that's it. Or we could have somebody come into town, go to that 175 acre park that you guys are gonna build on the north side of town with the botanical gardens and the deer sanctuary and a big lake where people can fish. And 40 years from now, when this area in that part of town looks like St. Louis, we'll have a 170 something acre park up there a beautiful green spot in the middle of a dirty city. 
And your guys would be the names on there that said, we came up with this idea 40 yeah. years from now. Yeah. We just I gotta, don't know. I'm just we got to have somebody donate that. the land. Huh? Well, I'll tell us our GoFundMe account. We need 3.4 mil. <laughs> Come on now. All I know is for me, if you wanted to charge me and just specifically me a little bit in my taxes to cover a sharpshooter, to stand 10 feet up and take out deer effectively and humanely on the north, way up there on the north side of town while shooting towards the river with that gun, I'll pay a little extra in my taxes and I bet I can find a lot of people in Cape who will too to cover those costs. Because I just can't see you guys out there making pin cushions out of deer. And that's what happens. It's not a very effective way to kill an animal unless you're willing to chase it and follow it off that private property onto some private, on, off that public property onto some private property. So, you know, you guys got a chance right here, right now, to say something different. You know, let's not kill something. Let's not think like it's 1950. Let's think towards 2050. We've looked yeah. at a lot of options. Sharp oh, well, and the thing is, is I already know, just by looking at you, what the answer is. And if this goes through, I'm going to sell my property and move somewhere else because I certainly don't want to live in a town where this is the best option you can come up with. And more than half the people are going to vote for it. I, that's not me. And after 25 plus years living here, if, like I said, if this is the best y'all can do, then I'm going to look for digs elsewhere. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you, Keith. And I believe we have one more. Charles Cruz. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. My name is Charles Cruz. I live on the 1900s block of Bend Road. I don't want to get reminded uh, to. I have some questions, actually. Uh, did you exclude the white, the, the albinos? Are they excluded from this? They are not. We can't be. Why not? Because the state constitution says the Missouri Department of Conservation controls the animals. Well, we don't. First off, they have no camouflage. They have no protection. And that's kind of... You know what I'm trying to say there. Okay, uh, is it five individual hunting sessions, five different days, or is it? I, I couldn't see the screen very well. Five different. It is, it is five consecutive seven-day periods. Five seven. Five right. consecutive seven-day periods. So it would be, for example, November first through the seventh. Um, five weeks. Five consecutive weeks. Yeah. And then thirty-five days, in other words. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, the maps you showed this. Where can I can, can obtain some of those? We can get you one. I like one of each area if it's possible. Like I lived in Cape for 70 years. And I, I guess I'm a local, I don't know. I'd say I you are. Born there, but that's beside the point. But I've lived in the north end of town all my life. And it's a pretty area. Okay, this was voted down, I think about seven, eight years ago. It was put on a ballot for the people to vote on. And they voted down. So Actually, it was approved by the council and then brought back by the public and voted down. It was put on the ballot. Yep. Yes. Right. I, I worked on that campaign. I had guys say, you can't do this. I said, I won't put it on the ballot. You say yes or no. That's just the way I feel about it. It's just, I mean, that's the way it should be done. The people should have the final say, in my opinion. All righty. Uh, let's see. My private property, can they come in on my property and hunt? No. no. I've got about 15 acres. No. Okay, I'll post it then. It's off limits. It's off limits. Okay. Uh, like I said, it's put up and voted the first time. And it it, it uh, failed. Uh, Charles, here's a copy of those maps if you want them. Okay. You want to... I want one, one of every. There's one of every area there. Area. You will come up and get them after you're done? Yeah, I just want The whole presentation will be posted on the city website. I'm just going to give him these. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Just for general knowledge. I mean, those are not real clear <laughs> copies, but that tells you about the property. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to get this short and sweet. I've asked the city several times when you come over Bend Road out there at 1900. To post, they got one down there by uh, 
Cape Rock Drive. But I've asked for more deer crossing signs, and I've, I've never had any more response on it. I've got an area there, they run right across from Ferguson Drive. They go across there. And I'll continue that conversation. That's his ward, so That's he will ward, so he'll yeah. take care of that. Okay. Uh, speed limit. I live out there, and those people go 80 miles an hour through there. We had a man last week. He came over uh, Bend Road. He took out a light pole there to make a call. Two garbage cans. Went on past my driveway, got down there, got the third garbage can, jumped two 10-foot ditches, hit a tree, wound up in this man's front yard. Now, he wasn't driving no 45 no. miles an hour. I think it needs to be patrol mode is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Dan, can you take care of contacting? If I'm in my driveway, I go to pull out, I see a car coming over the hill, or one coming up the hill, I don't pull out. This time you get straightened up going, they're on your, they're on you, plain and simple. Okay, uh, okay, the Kelso Bird Sanctuary, anybody familiar with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that off limits? Yes. Good, because my property is... It's off limits. Uh, but to that. Okay, I think that's pretty well got the questions I had there to answer. Okay. Uh, is this more or less a cut and dried deal that after the third reading it's going to happen? Well, after the second and third reading it'll happen. But that's two weeks. That's We have a first reading tonight, and in two weeks do the second and third reading. So, in other words, the, to put on a ballot, that won't happen? No. Why not? Because it's not something we can put on a ballot. It was before? No. The council passed it last time, and then the people put it on the ballot because right. they wanted it so wanted, wanted it overturned. We need groups up if we don't if we don't want that's right and get so many signatures or whatever. Right, but it has to be. No, it's passed first, and then it has you, to pass first. And then you would do a recall. And then you do a basically a, a petition to overturn that. Okay. Well, gentlemen, I think you uh, give me a. A little bit of insight on what I'm wanting to know. Personally, okay. I enjoy them. I mean, I know there's a lot of them. They went down there on Lexington, put all those apartments in, took all that uh, Russian olive out. Boy, they got thicker. Then there's got some man went out here on Lexington and Bend Road. He cleared a bunch of that out. I guess it's to develop it to sell it. Boy, they just got thicker. I mean, it's not the deer's fault. No, it's not. Plain and simple. I mean, no. Somebody comes and runs you out of your house, you're going to go to the neighbor, and it's going to be <laughs> plain and simple. That's, just, that's the way it goes. But like I said, I, personally, I'm not a tree hugger, but I just enjoy the wildlife. Uh, yeah. And they, uh, personally, they, they got more right here than we do. But, <laughs> nah, not anyway, but All right. thank, thank you, you Charles. Time and I got up on my soapbox and said my two cents worth. So. Appreciate you coming. Thank you, Charles. Yes, thank, you. Thank, thank you very much, Charles. Miss Ramona. Pardon? I was calling Miss Ramona. I almost overlooked. I knew you were on this list. I just went. You were first, and I went right down the list and missed you. <laughs> Happy Black History Month! Hey. Y'all hey. excited? Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see what our city's going to do for it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm here because most of what. <laughs> Most of what I was going to say, Renita pretty much, <laughs> Renita, let me get serious. Renita pretty much covered a lot of the things that I was going to say, but I just wanted to, <laughs> Charlie, stop laughing. I just wanted to say, and a lot of the things that I heard other people say, I also agree with. Uh, I was pretty much against, you know, any type of urban deer hunting. And I still pretty much am, but after hearing your presentation, which was really good, sorry we was being disruptive. Uh, <laughs> um, that it was very made it made it very some things clear that I was like well okay well it could possibly be too many deer running around me like me you know, like, I'm okay with seeing the deer they're in my backyard the albino deer has been in my backyard you know I just like seeing them when they come through <coughs> came through with her two babies and fed them in the backyard it's like 
we the kids like come look you know look out the window so it's like an occasion when they come out you know so i would be sad like oh man they're not going to be here anymore because they got killed they're always they're always going to be deer in this community yeah i'm not going to get rid of that the number probably does need to go down but i just don't feel comfortable with untrained people having these and i know they said that they have to have this and have to have that but i'm more like with that guy if you can get like one or two people in here specifically trained who know what they're doing but having a lot of people doing it i just don't feel safe so you'd rather have people with guns come in town and no shoot? the 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 crossbow things that they were talking about <laughs> not guns no. no and not the air shooters or nothing like that i mean i don't want them to have any of it because even people have mishaps with firearms so they can hurt themselves or somebody else still with with the crossbow it's no safety guarantee there's never going to be a safety guarantee so i'm like to keep it 100 just like don't do it but i mean if we really if the plants mean that much to everybody you know <laughs> i don't want to leave anybody out but you know it's like you got a fence back there you know but you know and if that's a lot of the issue and i know everybody can't just grab up 10 grand and build them a fence but you know if you can do it it will help <laughs> uh but other than that uh yeah so that's pretty much all i was gonna say i think it's pretty much covered and so if you guys sounds like you're gonna pass it but i hope the uh all the other things that were brought up or you know put into that if you do decide to and you know the people still might come forward and say hey we're going to vote on this and say hey we're going to that's the people's right to do that no matter right what we do. decide that's, that's our right to do that that's our right to do that people if we don't want this we if they pass it that means we get to, we have to bring it out and vote okay we have to vote it down like we did the last time you weren't this big of a piece of a work in high school <laughs> 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 Any uh, anybody else to speak before the council on this item? One more thing, if I may, that we haven't really addressed. Okay, so I'll make it quick. Uh, Bonnie again. Um, we have that ordinance that did come out after the vote got, you know, after the thing got turned down back in 2013 about not feeding the deer and yet there are people in this town that feed deer You're right. so can we get that information at least out as well with all of this information that's already going to be going out and people getting worried and i actually tend to agree let's just get one sharpshooter bite the bullet pay the price um because then at least we would have then going forward maybe i don't know because it seems like from what Dustin's saying, it's going to take quite a while to get under control. And and so maybe a sharpshooter first, and then, I don't know. But can we at least address that feeding of the deer? Because I have already seen one of my neighbors doing it, and I'm going to say something to her. But I know that it's we did pass something You see him doing it, you can take pictures of it and report it. Okay. okay. That's all I can and there's you. a fine or something? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, it would be something to bring up again. Uh, because Man, I, I make your neighbors people, real happy. New but... people have moved the community too, and I love looking at Bambi, not, you know, from the ground where I broke my leg. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but if we could bring that issue up again too, that that it is illegal to feed the deer in town. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank That's you. It. And I'll see you again in two At this point, I think we'll do the consent agenda. Eric? Over 21-11, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of special tax bills on properties for the closure of dangerous buildings and for the abatement of nuisance under the provisions of Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Cape Girardeau. An ordinance authorizing the issuance of special tax bills on properties for the closure of dangerous buildings and for the abatement of nuisance under the provisions of Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 of the Code of Ordinances, the City of Cape Girardeau. Number 21-12, an ordinance spending Schedule C of Section 26-121 of the State Code by adding stop signs at various locations in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, an ordinance spending Schedule C of Section 26-121 of the State Code by adding stop signs at various locations in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. 
number 21-13 and ordinance amending schedule f of section 26-247 of the city code by establishing no parking anytime at various locations in the city of cape Girardeau, missouri and ordinance main schedule f of section 26-247 of the city code by establishing no parking anytime at various locations in the city of cape Girardeau, missouri number 21-14 a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a performance guarantee agreement with Missouri, Boomer 21-15, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a performance guarantee agreement with EED Development LLC for the Number 21-16, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a performance guarantee agreement with Meyer Properties Open. 21-17, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a housing agreement with the Humane Society of Southeast Missouri and the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. You have before you the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Shannon, second by Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. New ordinances. Bill number 21-18, an ordinance amending chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by changing the zoning of property located at 1246 and 1248 Meadowbrook Lane in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri from M2 to M1. So moved. Second. Motion made by Robbie, seconded by Dan. <coughs> Any discussion? This is the public hearing deal. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 21-19, an ordinance amending Chapter 17 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, by, adapting a new by adopting a new section, 17-104, relating to urban deer hunting. So moved. Second. Motion by Robbie, seconded by Shannon. Discussion? Amendments? Yeah, there's a number of amendments. Okay. Can we just start from the beginning? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to go? You got it? I can read. Um, Let's start with uh, subparagraph B1 and remove and remove target shooting permitted under this ordinance. Second. I would prefer you did them individually. You have to do them individually. Okay. Motion by Shannon and seconded by Stacy. You want to discuss this? I think the, the, the whole purpose of this is for hunting only, not target shooting. Yeah. It was an yes. Okay. It was an oversight. It was from the ordinance from 13 years, uh, eight okay. years ago. Right. Yeah. So then. Okay. okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? That, that amendment passes. Um, hold on. Next one I have is subparagraph C5. Um, <clears throat> I think what Robbie and I are concerned about is that no one under the age of 18 should be hunting in this managed deer hunt. So is there any, I don't know what language you need to use except, go ahead. I had thought that, um, <laughs> of course I, I had thought that that there could be an amendment that says to that section that just says that there shall n uh, uh, no one be under the age of 18 to be able to hunt and then retract um, the valid hunter educate or I'm sorry retract the or who was born before January 1st 1967 if you that was something that so basically what we're saying is no one under the age of 18 and all should be an HEC certified. Correct. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay, Dustin, we already have. Hold on, Dustin. Yeah. So 
over the age of 18, you have to have the certification just to get a hunting license. Okay. So, so just over the age of 18. Not part of it. We're just okay. Okay. So we're just moving so, to amend that no person under the age of 18 should be allowed in this management. Okay. Correct. Right. Strike everything after the word "take your order." <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. I that is fine. Okay. We've already got that, and we've discussed it. Was, any any further discussion? discussion? We are able to do that within the purview of the established lottery lottery system uh, under the Missouri Department. Of I will verify it with the Department of Conservation, but I believe so. Okay. So we. Can, I will get verification. On that. All right. Okay. So we can make the amendment and. We'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay. So Any that other was, discussion? If not, all those in favor of this amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That amendment also passes. Okay. Uh, the next one is subparagraph E, number four. I would like to remove the words a city nuisance abatement officer and replace with the Cape Girardeau Police Department. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion? We police department or police department? Police department. It's to keep it consistent with. It keeps it consistent yeah. throughout the resolution. That's. Yeah, I'm going to say police department. I've changed okay. my mind. Okay. Any other discussion? Again, this is just for continuity in the resolution, and that's okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That amendment also passes. Guys, I, I, for the sake of being able to put our feet to the fire and come back and revisit this, I'd like to put an expiration on the term of 1231-2021. Or do you want to just... I, I just wanted to make sure that at 12:31, 20, uh, 21, that we are forced to come back here and discuss this. That's it. If it expires, though, you have to go through the whole process of no redoing it. Do you not? Yeah, you'd have to. You'd have, you'd to, have to come back and do the first reading again, and the second and third reading again. If we somehow put language in there to say. This is an annual event. Yeah, but I, I think that it's important to have this conversation every year. If, the, if this is done safely and effectively, we won't and, have the problem. And carefully, and, and we'll do it each time. We can either grow or we cannot grow. This gives us the opportunity to evaluate what has happened and come back next year and address any other concerns. And, and I mean, quite frankly, on the other end of that, it's not to say that we l look after next year and we think that the program has went fine and then we don't put a term on it. Mm -hmm. Then we have a problem. But I think for this first year, we, we are going to have to hold ourselves accountable to the residents because, quite frankly, I don't want to go through what we went through in 2013. Well, you're still going to go through it, I think. <laughs> well, well, then fair enough. Dustin. 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 I will say, if we do have to do this, and go through two meetings and take a question for this time, because all of these folks are going to work out. It will be a much simpler process. So I'm not opposed to it because the hard work's been done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the leg work's been done, and then all we have to do is tweak in our new stats. Um, with how successful that was and all those other things. So I'll be real honest, I'm not real opposed to it because the base ordinance is set, all we have to do is represent it. So it, 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 it should be all right because this is the hard thing to get done. Yeah. Because there's so much work to do. Okay. But right. then we have to approve any expansions or contraction. We would then have to go through, as part of that renewal process, we, if we decide to expand it to other areas, we'd have to outline that then or expand the number of permits or anything like that. And even if you were to expand it or shrink it, even without an expiration, we would still have to bring this up to the council for a first, second, and third reading mm -hmm. because it would actually be a change to the ordinance. It would be a change to the ordinance. So, okay. okay, I get that. That's so good. I'm good with that. All okay. right. So I, I, I would suggest then that we could change Article 3 to say this ordinance shall be in full force and effect from an after- um, 10 days after its passage and approval and shall expire 
on December 31st, 2021. That's exactly what I said, Eric. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Shouldn't say it out loud. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Yeah. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion also carries. You have now before you the amended ordinance 21-19. Any further discussion on the amended ordinance? Mayor, I feel us having lived through the 2013 and seeing the work that Dustin put into this, I mean, quite frankly, myself, I would have supported something that was much more zealous um, in, in hunting and extracting this, considering I'm one of those that see 13 to 20 deer walking five feet from my front door uh, or back I door. See my doorbell yeah, I know. My <laughs> and so I, I would have supported something much more zealous in that. With that being said, having read this and seen this, this is um, much more tame. The areas uh, are, are, are much further away from what some of the concerns were back then. And I really feel like this is a great first step for us to be able to get some information, see how it is managed, and give that opportunity to Dustin and and uh, and, and see what see what uh, we can accomplish. Um, may, maybe Mayor Fox is right. Maybe there'll be a referendum anyway. Uh, but I I feel like this is much different than than uh, and I'm 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 happy about the the new forward. So anyway, wanted to throw that out there. Oh, I'm still very tenuous about this. Uh, it's still kind of, you know, it's just not something that I'm comfortable with because I, at the end of the day, there will still be deer. There will still be deer hopping fences and eating roses and everything. We're not fixing the deer problem. Uh, it's almost inconsequential whether or not we do this or not because there will still be deer, uh, lots of deer. And so I, I don't... I don't know if this is necessary. Like, are we actually doing something with this? All I said was it's a beginning. Yeah. And we'll just have to see what happens. I don't think that if we woke up in 20 years from now, I don't think this would be the ordinance or the way that we would extract deer from our community. But this is definitely a first step. And if you would talk to the, uh, the Missouri Conservation Department, I would think that they would probably... I mean, obviously, they support this in, in, in doing that. Um, but I understand your side, Dan. I yeah. do. Okay. Uh, I, I just, to address your point, I mean, and address some of the points made, yeah, in an ideal scenario, maybe you would have a sharpshooter come in and we pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to have them come in and extract them and extract all the meat and get it processed and get a cent. But this is the most cost effective and a step in the right direction to then reassess and see if it is an effective means or what needs to be tweaked to make it an, an effective means to kind of quell the population growth because yes is it going to make a difference well yeah if we get up to 80 that's 80 deer that aren't then procreating and creating other deer and then next year if we get 80 deer it's another 80 deer you know yes it's not going to happen overnight but that's the like Dustin said the population growth didn't happen overnight either but at least we're somewhat taking a step to slow it down so okay all those in favor of the amended motion signify by saying aye aye any opposed okay bill number 21-20 an ordinance amending chapter 25 of the code of ordinances of the city of cape Girardeau, missouri regarding administrative relief and exceptions so moved second motion made by robbie seconded by dan any discussion i just wanted to say and i brought these concerns up to um scott uh, offline is that I think it's important that they establish some sort of formal process that I think this is great to create efficiencies but some way to uh, inform these citizen advisory boards the Board of Adjustments and the PNZ of what exceptions were made so that they're at least notified that this is what was made yep. yeah we will do that they do that all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all those opposed motion carries we have two appointments this evening to the tree board, and those appointments are Jennifer Benkin and Laura Klipfell. So moved. Second. Motion made by Robbie, seconded by Nate. Any, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I thank you all for your diligence tonight.
uh, thank the people for came, who came and uh, expressed their opinions. Uh, it's a touchy subject, but uh, I think we uh, I think we did it right. I don't think there's any other business. I got, I got one question. Yes. Our next meeting is scheduled. I just saw it. That's why I want to bring it up. The next meeting scheduled for the 15th, which is President's Day. Are the city offices open on President's Day? Yes, we are. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. I'll entertain a motion. We adjourn. So moved. Motion by Robbie. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Nate, I was going to say, but wait, that's a bank holiday. I can't be here. Yeah, like. <laughs> 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 He won't be in his guard here. <coughs> no.